It's time for Mac Break Weekly. Renee Ritchie's here. Andy Nako's here. Alex Lindsay's in studio. We'll talk about Apple's quarterly results. I know it was last week, but there's a lot to say about that. Rumors about the next generation iWatch and what we are going to see in the cameras in the next iPhone. It's going to blow your mind. Plus, why Justin Trudeau is peeking out from my chest. It's all coming up next on Mac Break Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for MacBreak Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is MacBreak Weekly, episode 570, recorded Tuesday, August 8th, 2017. Bare chested Justin. MacBreak Weekly is brought to you by WordPress. Your customers want to find you. So build a WordPress.com website and help them connect with your business. Get 15% off any new plan purchase at WordPress.com slash MacBreak. And by Dollar Shave Club. For a great shave at a great price, join Dollar Shave Club. New members get their first month of the Executive Razor and a tube of Dr. Carver's Shave Butter for only $5 with free shipping. Get yours at dollarshaveclub.com slash MacBreak. And by Texture. Access the world's most popular magazines anytime, anywhere using your smartphone or tablet. Try it free for 14 days at texture.com slash twit. It's time for Mac Break Weekly, the show where we talk about the latest news from Apple. Look, lo and behold, in studio, I can touch him and... We're gonna, somebody said we got to really get a, special a box to put around you so that you look like you're here. It's Alex <laughs> Lindsay. He is here from um, all Pixel the way Core, from all the way from San, San Rafael. Rafael. Did you ride the train, the new light rail? No, I haven't. It's not, it's not set it, up yet. It's not really running yet. No. no. Someday you'll be able to do I that. Though. Instead, I just had to, to ride the Narrows. <sighs> oh, yeah, that's the worst. Well, that's a local problem. <laughs> <laughs> we, we won't bore people with that. Back from his trip to New York City, Renee Ritchie is here. He was down there talking about iOS, writing about iOS 11 and photography. Yes, sir. And I also want to point out that Alex's lip sync is perfect today. Let's not yeah. move. Let's not Isn't that interesting? How did we do that? Oh, man. We worked on that one. Dang uh, is your article up on iMore.com? Yes, it is. I'll, I'll put it in the, in the show notes. Because I really uh, am very interested in that. Because one of the things I'm thinking about is instead of bringing a laptop on my uh, next trip, bringing an iPad with iOS 11 on it. The 10.5 Mac. Yeah. Macro. Can I do it? The only can thing you can't do, do is a portrait mode. I don't care. Yeah. I want No, I want to bring a camera. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to bring a camera, although having oh, a nice the, camera the edit, on the iPad. Yeah. But I'm thinking for all the pro, all the post and, and, and selection and triage and all that stuff. And I really haven't used Lightroom on, on the on the iPad. Do you, it's pretty good. Do you like it? Yeah I'll, yeah, I'll talk about that in a second. The interface is weird, but it's good. It's a really good guy. App. He's the guy to ask. Also with us, another guy who is a avid photographer and Mac aficionado I can't even think of the word now aficionado Mr. Andy Anaco from the Chicago all I care about is that you you pronounce my name right that's all I care all the other words don't matter I have no idea how to spell it but I do know how to pronounce it Anatko ladies and gentlemen right after the show last week they do it they do it every time Apple announced its results and a bit of a surprise, Renee. Did, because you were on assignment, did you were you able to listen to the call anyway and do your traditional? I listened to it while walking the streets of New York City. But we and Serenity Caldwell is away defending the honor of Canada in the roller derby world championships or something in oh, Europe. Congratulations! And just defeating, she's doing her team is doing great. So fingers crossed. So we had uh, Lori Gill, Micah Sargent, and uh, Joe Keller stepping in for us, and they did a phenomenal job. So uh, there were surprises, right? Apple did better in this quarter, uh, its third fiscal quarter, than it normally does. This is usually the slow quarter, right? Yeah, I'm getting to that age, Leo. I don't know if it's just me being, uh, just I don't know, disgruntled by all this stuff. But it, a lot of it is just math. It's like how many weeks are in the month? What happened last yeah. year in the year-to-year -year compares? Was there a surplus? Was there a shortage? Did people upgrade early? Did they upgrade late? And everyone is breathless about these things. But then when you go after the call or two or three hours after the call, it's like, oh, this is why all that happened. And yeah. They didn't I mean they, they're making more money than anybody. Yeah. It just keeps happening. Yeah. Well, you see how spiky their revenue is in this graph from mm -hmm. um, from Mac Rumors. It's really uh, 
in the last few years, it's all been all about iPhones, and it's highly predictable. Uh, the the big spikes, though, and notice they're up every single you know fourth quarter. Uh, those are the fourth quarter spikes, and uh, it's because of the iPhone sales. Now, there's somebody. Some people have been saying that Apple's going to try to move iPhone sales out of the because they usually only get a week or two in the last quarter of iPhone yeah. sales. Move it all fully into the first quarter by delaying the release of the next iPhones till October. You think that's reasonable? I don't think they do that for Wall Street. I mean, there's there's a myriad of reasons they might have to do that, but they've been doing this for years, yeah. and I think that idea probably occurred to Tim Cook second 0.01. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah, <laughs> they're not dumb. Uh, yeah, all, Apple's at an all-time high as we begin the show. The chat room's telling me one hundred sixty-one dollars and ten cents, which is kind of remarkable. Does that put them in the trillion dollar to the trillion dollar? Not number? yet. They're getting close. Yeah, they're getting there. So, and you and I, I agree with you. And I thinking in quarters is really not. This is one of the one of the problems in America is that we is that businesses are kind of by the markets required to think in terms of quarterly results when that that isn't really how you should be thinking of it. And growth. I mean, if Apple makes a gazillion dollars and they don't make a gazillion point two next year, right. even if they make a gazillion point one, it doesn't matter. We don't want money. We want the possibility of future money we don't actually have yet. Big news. Yeah, also, it feels a little bit less uh, less important because with other companies, a bad quarter means that a CEO is no longer CEO. Mm -hmm. Apple, they have to have a lot of bad quarters before they have to answer yeah. to anybody but God. Even even God <laughs> would be like, I'm gonna I'm gonna hang with you for another three years just in case you do wind up with that 3D sensing phone. But but until then, <laughs> yeah, why wouldn't you really? If, if you got you're an Apple. upgrade coming, <laughs> um, the stock uh, went up quite a bit, of course, after the uh, results were announced. And and you know the reason it's high is it's it's staying high. Let me let me get some uh, let me get some more of these uh, charts here. The current um, at this current market cap is eight hundred thirty two billion. So they still got a way to go if you're going to hit. The fun part for me, and I don't know if I'm jumping too far ahead here, is when they gave the projections for next quarter, everyone just stopped and said, wait a minute, those projections seem to include new iPhone sales, which usually is a no-brainer. But there was so many rumors about delays, and they couldn't right. do it. And it'd be pushed out to this quarter or that quarter or this year. And it turns out maybe not so much. Boy, if you bought Apple stock one year ago, um, you would have seen a pr like a $50 a share increase over the last year alone and this is when everyone said that they were in trouble yeah panic <laughs> well okay but i do want to say that there's a difference between how the stock market does right and the long-term future of a company right and apple is absolutely firing on all cylinders right now with the iphone but that doesn't mean that in three years it's going to look like this no. They were worried about then. Like they were worried about that quarter. Like Apple's Apple's down. Apple's gonna stay right. down. The stock's well, never gonna true. bounce back. No, that's true. Yeah. Also, it's important just to keep in mind that Apple stock is an Apple product. So you okay. can have a bad you can have a bad performing Apple product, but that doesn't mean that they still aren't, aren't gonna make lots of money off of the Macs and lots of money off the iPhones and everything else. Right. Well, and that was one of the good news uh, features of this quarterly report is iPad sales uh showing some real strength. I think both the new iPad Pros, uh, the 10.5 inch, and the uh, the strength of the $329 entry level iPad um, show, showed for the first time in a long time an increase in iPad uh, unit Am sales. Am I misremembering? But didn't the ASP suggest that it was the entry level iPad that was it really, did. I guess, getting yeah, a lot yeah. of people to turn over? Yeah, it was mostly the most of the fact that you get a $329 iPad. Yeah, which prompted all those long, long in the in the, in the pocket uh, upgrades. Unit sales twenty up twenty eight percent over the previous quarter, fifteen percent year over year. We haven't seen growth like that in the iPad in a couple of years. And you don't see that growth like that in in most mature markets. <laughs> you know, so, a good point. You know, it's been out well for a long time. It. So that that yeah. kind of jump. And I think that might maybe some of it was pent up. You know, people didn't really they they you know a lot of the iPads um, didn't. I mean, you my kids would use an iPad too. Or an iPad, you know, or a newer iPad, yep. and they didn't really notice the difference when they're right. playing Minecraft or doing whatever. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the things we may see, especially as we move forward, is with AR, with some of the other things that are going to push the processors harder, that you may see a, a larger growth in the iPad because there's there's going to be apps that are really taking advantage of the chip systems rather than, you know, kind of staying with, a mo you know, a vast majority of the apps are not taking full advantage of the hardware. And I think that's what also affects the, the sales. Highest global market share in four years in markets like China and Japan, Tim Cook said, over half of the iPads are sold to people buying their first iPad. So some of the growth is new markets. Mm -hmm. 
But I have to say, uh, you know, uh, that I think that new iPad Pro combined with iOS 11, I know you're going to talk about that a little bit uh, later, Renee, really is impressive. That is that is even a coming of age for the iPad. Yeah, and it, it's, it's, it's the same thing we'll probably talk about with the iPhone later, is that they're attacking the market from multiple fronts. The low-cost iPad appeals to people who have had an iPad 2 and want to upgrade, but also people who have bought crappy video tablets and just have had a terrible experience with them. And I think Tim Cook in previous years has said that they're happy to be someone's second purchase, you know, because they, they, there are every, every Christmas Android Central is flooded with people who bought a crappy $50 tablet at whatever big box store or online provider, and it just doesn't work, and they get, they get really upset. And at, at, that, at the price of the new iPad, I think some of them are willing to go a little bit higher just to get something they think will work. Also big news, uh, and Tim talked a lot about augmented reality, and he pointed out, and this is undeniable, with hundreds of millions of people actively using the iPhone and iPad today, iOS will instantly become the world's biggest augmented reality platform as soon as iOS 11 ships. Is 11 uh, works on better on newer, uh, pres the presumed new iPhone and the new iPad, but it works still on other older devices? Yeah, anything 64-bit. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Andy. So, yeah, so the iPhone 5S and newer, um, I really think the limiting factor for AR is going to be frame rate more than anything else uh, because once you get the frame rate down, AR starts to break a little bit. At least that's been my experience. So I, the, the question, uh, though, going back to something you said a moment ago, is whether there's going to be such a big AR hit like Pokemon Go, that the difference between my iPad will run Pokemon Go, my old iPad, the, and this other person's iPad will not run uh, Pokemon Go, if that will be the sort of thing that gets people who were maybe open to upgrading for the past couple of years to finally get down the Apple Store with, a, with an open wallet. I think one of the things, we're, we're doing a lot of AR work right now, and one of the things that we've noticed is that, uh, you know, when you really, what's going to start pushing these um, in a lot of ways is also a, a polygon count. So, Right now, uh, we find that the performance gets pretty chunky um, on a variety of platforms at about one to one and a half million polygons, um, which is still, I mean, I used to do game, to, I used to build game models in the 90s when I had to make a, something in 256 polygons. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, amazing, a million, a million and a million and a half. I mean, we, could, we, we're, I mean <laughs> we didn't, I mean, uh, we barely rendered for us, the movie I worked on, we barely rendered anything over a million polygons. So the idea that's that in real time, uh, it's, it's quite a quality. thing. Yeah. Um, but the, However, uh, it's but, more than frame rate or resolution. That's going to make or break AR kit. Really good article by a guy named Daniel, or, uh, Daniel Eckler, who's been working in augmented reality for many years now, explaining, this is on Medium, it's in the startup on, uh, on Medium, explaining um, how the technology of AR, and um, actually this may not be the article I was thinking of. There's, there's one that talks about the technology, and the real issue with AR is not so much a uh, frame rate, uh, of course, that's going to be important, the quality of the image being superimposed on the real world. But the real difficult thing to do, and the thing that demos always overstate, that you know, because he says, don't ever trust an AR YouTube demo because mm -hmm. you're seeing only when it worked perfectly, right. is that placing that thing in the real world, placing it on tables so it's like it's on a table, placing it so it can move behind things, that's very difficult. All of these things are computationally incredibly difficult to do. And that is going to be the, I think, ultimate test of consumer acceptance is whether it just looks like po Pokemon Go. Just, you know, there's nothing to do there. It's just a thing floating on the street. But if it actually is interacting with the real world. And, and this is the stuff that we've that's been challenged. That's hard. Yeah. In, in visual effects, we call this match moving. So match moving is match something moving, that, yes, right. you know, we're trying to sync somebody. In pix and, and the problem really in, in match moving is... Uh, that you're either it's either 100 percent correct or it's zero because it's sliding you know and so you, it's, it's unacceptable um, right and so you really do get into these these situations and of course you have to decide what the resolution of the tracking needs to be for a given you know a given piece but generally it has to be highly accurate and especially where they are it has to be highly accurate and so those are a mixture of and, and those are a mixture of processing the pixels um, you know that, that are there but the laser helps a lot because right now the pixels are really good at planes that's what most of what AR kit that we've seen so far right is saying I know where the table is I know where the floor is um, but AR doesn't AR kit right now doesn't have a really good sense of scale doesn't have a sense you know has a sense of position whereas when you look at the tango platform you're, you're dealing with something that is actually you know can see the space that it's in and make some right. you know, make some choices so that's about the that. point and this is the article and I apologize it's Matt Mieseniks Mieseniks uh, from also from Medium and Super Venture blog, why ARKit is better, 
And what, what, he, what he does say, in fact, is that Tango and AR kit are very similar. But the reason Tango hasn't taken off, that's the Google solution, is because Google doesn't control it. the hardware platform. You also can't get it. I mean, yeah. we had that. Well, that's because it doesn't control the hardware platform. Right. Our if, Tango phone came from, a, from eBay. Right. Uh, you we know. just ordered the Asus Zenfone AR, that's, which that's is a Tango phone. So we'll be, this is the first kind of widely available real phone plus Tango. Yep, and, and that's the one we have. We've, we got it. In what general. do you think? Does it do well? It does well. It does okay. well. It is. Um, mm -hmm. We're using both Tango and Daydream as well as the AR kit. And, and it, it, um, it, it, it definitely does well. And again, in, in trying to generate 3D, now we're doing a couple funky things with it, but it's um, the, uh, I think Tango is a more accurate solution, but again, it, it also it's not really available. eats up. Well, it's unavailable. It eats up battery. It's you know, and I think that right. And I but I think that these these two may when we look at all the rumors that are kind of floating around, I think that the difference between Tango and AR Kit will be significantly smaller after the release of the phone iPhone eight than it is right now. Matt, this Matt yeah. Matt says it has some. I highly recommend reading this. And of course, you know all this, but Matt's been working in AR for nine years. He's built. He says technology is identical to AR Kit, but the title of his article is "Why AR Kit is Better Than the Alternatives." And a lot of it is because Apple, and they've always said this, controls the full stack, the hardware and the software. And you've got 100 million plus devices yeah. that are going to suddenly be able to use it. The so if you're, is, if you're a developer, you immediately say, well, there's no question. Am I going to develop for Tango or am I going to develop for AR kit? There's, there's no question. Well, have a continuous well it, it depends. It could, it, it could be something like uh, Google Glass for Enterprise where, uh, where uh, Google could be perfectly happy creating the AR platform that the military will definitely want to use, that the government will want to definitely want to use, that engineers will definitely want to use. It won't be quite so good for putting cartoon monsters on a park bench and then throwing a baseball at it, but it will be, it will be really, really good for, uh, for putting online documentation and walking uh, less skilled workers through what would be a very, very complicated uh, repair job or something that would allow uh, a camera manufacturer to suddenly have uh, incredible effects available to consumers that would be just crazy to con to contemplate uh, two or three years ago. So it, I think that the most important feature of, a of AR kit or any augmented reality is going to be presenting to a, a general user something that is just compelling and useful and and, and relevant. But that's the and risk. We, and, and if, if it, it doesn't well, look good, it's going to end up like VR has, which is, oh, a very promising technology. We thought this was great. We all tried it. And then it was like, yeah, fine. Well, well, I mean, there, there's such a thing. That's a good point. But there is such a thing as good enough. Maybe people don't necessarily want the photorealistic. I agree. Uh, it has to well, get to good maybe, enough. I mean, maybe, maybe, but maybe, exactly. But maybe what they really want is what if I have uh, iMovie and I have the ability to simply tag every every face that's recognized will actually have a little caption that follows this person around. Or what if this person, my 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 daughter, really really loves Wonder Woman, and I want her interacting with Wonder Woman, and I can just simply download a plugin or a model for iMovie that will let, will put Wonder Woman in the scene, and maybe they can't actually talk because that would be very very expensive. I don't know how much gig uh, costs for uh, for looping eight million kids' videos per day, but it's what 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 excites me about AR Kit above Tango. I love the I love the precision of Tango. I love what it could how, what it could do to actually create. Again, more practical, functional solutions. But I like the idea that AR Kit is. You know what? It's as if Apple is saying, "We have no idea what a what augmented reality is and good for. Right we have we have yeah. we have no we have absolutely the last clue on how to actually monetize this. We just thought, what the hell? What if we just introduce an API that's not right. perfect by any means, but will allow a lot of people to try a lot of things? And if any if if it has an effect on Tango by saying, wouldn't it be great if this really great ruler app that simply lets you that on i on the iPhone that lets you take a measurement of a window just by holding up your phone to it and and reading a, a measurement that's off of it. What if that were accurate to the millimeter instead of accurate to within an inch? And what if we because that's the that's one of the most downloaded apps on the App Store right now. If uh, looking forward to two or three months in the future, so that's that's why I think that in the history of augmented reality, AR Kit is going to be more important from what I see right now than Tango is, because it'll kickstart all that sort of innovation and idea thinking. We can't forget Microsoft's and HoloLens, but it's not going to be out for another year and a half or two years. They said mm. 2019. But uh, Mike says in this article that arguably HoloLens has the best hardware, but it's not a player. Similarly, Tango's not a player because Google never really made it a platform. He said, had Google made Tango, 
ubiqui ubiquitous on uh, Android, I, it would look like iPhone was playing catch up. The hard part is again the performance issues and so on and so forth. I think everybody's just getting started. I Google think that the, I to, the new iPhone will be designed to yeah. respond to those performance questions, right? I think so. I, I think yeah. that it. You know, but I think it's that be it's built for that. Right, and and I think that AR Kit is definitely much easier to develop for. So you're if you're going to do something first, you're going to do it on AR Kit. Um, right. You know, Tango is going to give you some tools that you don't have right now. The good news is is that a lot of your development is not being done in Xcode or into something else. You're doing it in Unity or Unreal Engine, and then you're figuring out how you customize it for the export. So that you know, a lot of the development is not going to be either or. Like most of the stuff that we're looking at is both. Right. You know, like it's not like just make sure that it works on on everything that's out there. You don't you don't need to uh, make that choice uh, very very often because the real challenge with most of the AR and VR, at least the stuff that we're working on, is is really all the, all the back end development of figuring out how you're going to acquire the the data, how you're going to um, build it out, and, and the actual the only thing that you really have to worry about for the platform is how you're interfacing with that that information. Right. Um, so so I don't think people are going to have to make choices, but I, again, our our pattern right now is still to build stuff for ARKit and see if it works really quickly, and then and then go into Tango. Unless we're trying to do precision, you know, like we need to know exactly where we are in the space. Good article, highly recommend it. Uh, it's, it's a great article. I read that. I read. Did that you read it? Yeah. Week, and I yeah. think there's a lot of uh, really. For somebody uh, like me who doesn't work as you do deeply with this stuff, this is yep. a very good basic introduction to how AR works, why Apple has an advantage, and it's chiefly because they can they have the hardware and software platforms together. And what a challenge it is. One of the things he says is there are only about 20 people in the world who have the skills to build this kind of hardware, but most of them are working building cruise missile tracking systems or Mars <laughs> rover navigation systems. They're not working in consumer mobile. Well, and, and most of that, I think, yeah. I think in, in that specific thing, I think it was the inertial, a lot of the inertial stuff. Yes. That, that's where the, the real uh, challenge is. Well, and it's also a huge challenge in doing it with a single RGB camera. Right, which uh, is going to go away. I and mean, I think that we're he not says that's, that's 18 months off at least. So we're not going to see the really, and that's maybe why HoloLens, why Microsoft said, you know what, we're, gonna not, we're not going to try to ship a consumer product till 2019. We, you yeah. know, that's when the hardware will really be there. And, and when we look at VR also, I mean, you know, HD came out in Japan in the 80s. You know, we didn't really see it in any yeah, kind of penetration until, yeah. you know, for 20 years later. And so I think that, you know, a lot of this stuff is very much in its very early stages of, mm -hmm. of what's going on here. And I think that um, things are going to get, they're going to get pretty interesting because we have a lot of very large companies that are all fighting for space, which is really good for us as consumers. Yeah, uh, that's, that's kind of an interesting observation, though about HD, like maybe, uh, it, maybe it was a feature that consumers were delighted to get for free. They weren't en masse entirely motivated to pay extra for it before it was impossible to buy a TV that wasn't at least 720 uh, HD. Uh, maybe it's maybe that's going to be the truth of AR too, that it's not going to be something that people are going to be willing to buy something to get. If it's built into a phone, they're really happy to get it for free. And then consequently, uh, they are consequently they're uh, happy to then buy content that uses AR. So well, and, again, and I think I think the real the uses. Platform. I think a lot of the uses are not going to be individuals buying AR. I think it's going to be locations and people and companies uh, using AR as a marketing tool, as a as a well, like tool. IKEA's pr uh, proposed mm -hmm. uh, app, which would let you look at your room and put IKEA furniture in it. That makes a lot of sense. Yep. That doesn't have to be perfect. It's okay if the chair is floating a little bit you still can kind of get a sense what that furniture would look like, how it would fit into your room. I think for Ikea, well, that's a no-brainer. That's a, that's a great product. And, and, and again, if you look at the other end of that, let's just take real estate for just a second. Um, maybe, you, maybe Ikea builds uh, a bunch of all their furniture or Pottery Barn builds all their furniture um, in 3D, ready for a platform, ready to, ready to show it. The real estate agent goes in and acquires all the information of the house, you know, both lighting models oh, and, and data. And then presents and now, it. <laughs> now you can sit there and you can say, I want to put this furniture in. And I yeah. want to look at it and I can see what it looks like. Those are the kind of things that are not that far away. Again, it's not being paid for so by that's the consumer, but it's that's selling the, the house. That's the tango style mapping where you pre-map a space. It's now a model, which you could then send, send to a customer with in some, you know, this is what the paint job will look like or yeah. And, and you really have you can then then they can really envision envision it any way they want to envision it and and you and all of that stuff's there and and you know a lot of us have talked about that for fifteen years it's just that the technology is finally getting up to speed and you know tank acquiring the house with Tango would be very slow and cumbersome but there are really good tools for that that are much faster we just need drones <laughs> we need drones that they will just them. go and map the whole thing I saw that in Alien I know it I know you can do it the uh, 
Yeah, the lidar drones are about fifteen thousand each. Oh, okay, geo, never geo mind. <laughs> So they're they're uh, they're out there. No, but but you can. I just here's my concern, and you guys can tell me uh, whether you think it's on or not. I think VR ended up being a disappointment. And I think by overselling VR, Facebook and other companies have actually damaged what VR will become in the future. And I think there's a risk here that by overselling AR, when consumers get their hands on it, that it's going to be like VR or 3D TV. They're going to go, oh, gimmick, nice, but I'm, I don't care. And that would damage... What will happen in in eighteen months or whatever? Well, and we've been playing with AR for a while. I mean, these are AR maps, and people had this stuff. This is not new at, stuff. No, it's, it's been not. For but years. the problem was with, when it was only inertial, and we talked about this years ago. Right. As soon as they start tracking the points, we were going to get a much better version of this. And and the thing is, is that I think it's going to be one of the things you're going to use AR as often as you look at Google Maps. If it's once it's good enough, and I and I don't I'm think it'll be that the risk is short term. If it's crappy and it's just a gimmick. And, and I think that's the challenge for ARKit without without the laser that I think we're going to end up, you know, what the rumor is, we're, we're going to start seeing those. Um, In the new iPhone? Uh, the I think we're going to see, I think we're going to see some some more depth information from the new iPhone. I mean, it's I pretty think that, clear that they're designing this around AR. Yeah. So I think that, I think that you're, um, I think you're going to see that. Um, I think, you know, from the rumors that we've seen so far going by. Um, and I think that if we get that, um, that data is pretty accurate pretty quickly. I think the challenge with AR is that right now, you know, when you're testing it, it is, you know, it slides around. It, you're just trying to find things. It's trying to, you know, it's the finding planes is difficult. It's very hard with a single sensor to get to be accurate. And and VR's problem was it made people nauseous. AR is not going to make people nauseous. You're not wearing it. It's not your entire world. I think VR has a whole bunch of problems. As someone who shoots a lot of it, um, but making people nauseous is a pretty big problem. Yeah, I mean that's a frame rate issue. I know there. So. Uh, yeah, no, I understand. Or whatever. I mean, there's convergence. It, I mean, there may be other reasons for it, but for whatever reason, if somebody tries VR and gets sick they're much less likely to try it again. No, absolutely. I mean, that's kind of the end of that for that person. But the, but I think that the, um, uh, again, frame rate, frame rates are, are a big issue with, with the, that, that nauseousness. It tends to be frame rate interocular, interaxial distance for the, for the camera, but inter apparent yeah. interocular distance is the, is the other two things that, that cause that problem. They always the, say that and they say, oh, the new one's got so much frame rate and still makes people sick though. It's the yeah. simulator so, sickness. So part of that super high vision is so high resolution so, it makes people well, sick. <laughs> it's one, too good now. One of the big problems with AR with with VR video is is that to make things look more three D, people who acquire it will make will will cre will create an interaxial distance, the distance between the virtual cameras. Right. They'll spread that out a little bit right. because it makes everything more three D. But yeah. when you take it off, you're it like, you, oh, you're, yeah. you know, and that's so, right. And so the um, so keeping that interaxial to a really comfortable level, things don't look as impressive. They don't right. look as three D. But when you take it off, you can always tell if it's a good acquisition when you can take the goggles off and it doesn't feel like you pop your eyes pop. Right. Um, when you when your eyes pop, that means that someone stretched it stretched it too far. If it looks flat, then they didn't stretch it enough. You know. And, and those are the but those are the things that that um, you know people again they they damage the platform when they try to push it further than right. what it, what it's ready to go. But I think that. I think most people like what we're looking at is integrated solutions where we're not thinking about AR, VR. We're thinking about AR and VR. Like if right. everything we do, we're going to capture reality. that data. Yeah. But I think everyone's, that's, I think that's the future of you're going to, because what's really hard is acquiring all that data. Right. <laughs> it's not hard to make it, put it on your headset, you right. know? And, and so um, the, so acquiring all that data properly and, and really um, and with high accuracy is going to help AR, but it's also people will use it later for VR. Renee, anything else from the uh, quarterly results we should note? No, again, the big thing to me was just how how aggressive, uh, maybe aggressive is the wrong word, but how how good the forecasts for next quarter were. And it seemed to include all sorts of Very good bullish. stuff. Shipping. Very bullish. Yeah. yeah. And we had the best Apple Watch quarter ever, but it's an Amazon number, so nobody really knows. What that yeah, is. the Amazon number was 50%, what, 50 yeah. increase. It was the best yeah. quarter ever over what we don't know. No, we don't know. Yeah. But they I mean, they're, they're selling, I, I forget, Ben Beharin had a number, but it was still, uh, I mean, they're firing on all cylinders right I now. I have to say, Max I- Max were up. As much as I think the Apple Watch is not a very interesting product, I, uh, I see more and more of them all the time. I see a lot of non-geeky, normal people wearing them all the time. So th that that the consciousness of the watch and desire for the watch has definitely penetrated the market. If we just and there was some the fear. Well, there was some fear when they discontinued the iPods, and people were like, "What are we going to use for like you know athletics and for running?" And I think the, we, more clearly with the rumors towards future I, um, Apple watches that this is going to sort of take the place yeah. of the thing that was under the iPod Touch. Andy, as we go forward, you had something to say. 
Uh, no, I was just going to say, I think that just reflects that Apple is uh, no, not Apple knows now what they're selling. Right. Uh, they, they they were selling it earlier for the, actually for the, maybe the first two years to believers, to people who said we have people are lining up to say, oh, we have great faith that whatever a smartwatch is, it's going to be great. And we're going to love it. Now, Apple is saying this is a really great fitness watch. And it also is a really good fashion watch. And if you like fashion and you don't mind being a little bit fitter, give us 300 bucks. We can help you on both accounts. Um, we will talk about the watch because there's rumors that there will be a new watch in uh, two months or a month. But we'll talk about that in a second. Mark Gurman, usually very accurate. Uh, I did want to mention the one last piece of the analyst call. Uh, this is Jason Snell uh, writing at Macworld.com. Almost every analyst call, someone tries to trick Apple executives into yeah. revealing their secret plans. So this time it was RBC Capital Markets. Amit Darya Nani, who asked... Should we believe the blogs and the component suppliers that the new iPhone might be delayed? Tim Cook said, we have no comment on anything that's not announced. To which Dariani, Darianani replied, fair enough. I figured it was worth a shot. And then, I love this, the microphones in Cupertino picked up an entire room full of Apple executives laughing out loud. <laughs> <laughs> there was, nice try, just, Amit. <laughs> nice try. <laughs> there was one other thing that was interesting. When they asked him about automation, because he's been more willing to talk about automation uh, sort of like he was willing to talk about augmented reality, then Apple typically is about future products. And he was pretty clear that automation, like augmented reality, they're not thinking about one product. So maybe a car is an obvious one, but they're yes. thinking about automation across a wide, Isn't as again, like a core technology like yeah. AR. Yeah. Well, and as Alex just pointed out, the LiDAR and the, and the things that map uh, the road for self-driving cars have absolute practicality in AR and other things. So well, there and, is a and, kind of a beneficial... And on the LiDAR Action. market, you know, Leica just created a, a cheaper, I mean, relatively cheaper LiDAR system. <laughs> right. Well, that was um, Google's big lawsuit against uh, Waymo and Lewandowski is that he'd stolen the cheap, because Google's LiDAR is one-tenth what it costs for the regular LiDAR. And they, they said they, he gave it to Uber. That's why they're so well, and this is this is one that just scans the room or an accident scene or, right. or whatever, and it's uh it's sixteen thousand dollars, you know, for this little what they call what a lot of people are calling a coffee can. It's like this little this little lidar. So it's system. a static lidar system. Yeah, you, you set it on a yeah. tripod and you and you scan stuff, but the because of AR, the demand for this thing it's, uh, it's a twenty week waiting period for wow. them to. Now these are very high precision in, instruments, so it's hard to get them anyway. But it's hard to build. It's hard to just increase the number that you're going to make. So Leica can only make them at a certain. And it doesn't pace. make a picture of them. It makes a three. It'll model. do a picture as well. Oh, it does. Because yeah, it uses the picture to. Um, it can use it as a mostly as, to color the the vertices, textures for the model. The, because yeah. all it does is it goes out and grabs a whole bunch of points. Right. It says I'm just going to grab all these points and then it colors all the points based on the color that it's scanning. Right. So that it kind of looks, looks like, like a room. Oh, it looks uh, on a on a high density scan. It'll look like the. Right. I mean, it'll really look like the room. Except there's just no uh, real surface to it. And then you run it through another conversion to put surfaces to the points. And of course, you have one. I don't have one. I, 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 I don't have. Is it. that I your pick this week? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I don't have one. I don't. I don't have a. I don't have. I have. I have friends with like seven hundred Alexes. Uh, no more than that. All right, let's take a break. We'll come back. We will talk about Mark Gurman in the next watch. Get your impressions. Renee Ritchie is here. From Canada, by the way, Renee, I wore something for you today. Oh, excellent! Uh, this is uh, this is my new T-shirt that represents ah. how we feel about Canada here in the United States of America. Monsieur Trudeau, <laughs> <laughs> excellent with the moose and the polar bear and There's the goose. There's a moose, and we've we've decided that Serenity Caldwell riding the polar bear over here. I mean, the uh, awesome. moose over here. With her yeah. skate, that's awesome. That's terrific. Oh, Thank you, Leo. Canada. <laughs> I got that at headlines.com if you want your own. <laughs> I should send you, you one. You too can get your Justin shirt. But I think it's fair that Americans should wear this, right? And then when I, <laughs> totally. when I, when I go, apparently they're using, what was it? The, the, the Rogers Stadium or something in Toronto to accommodate all the people fleeing the United States to become Canadian refugees? It's really we have, Did you see that? We have all, oh we have all the land up, up to the North Pole, Leo. We are, we are set for everybody. Do you have anywhere that doesn't have a cold winter? We cling to the border for warmth. If you would just install a heat pump, if you could install a heat pump at the Windsor-Detroit border, we could just sort of air match. It would be phenomenal. Also with us, Andy Anako from the Chicago Sun Times. Hi, Andy. Who? You seem a little subdued today. You're a little. Are you? Are you okay? Uh, um, I'm a little under the weather. Oh, I'm sorry to hear oh, that. We're sending good thoughts, Andy. Sending chicken soup. That would be more useful. For your soul. Chicken soup for your soul. 
and Alex Lindsay in studio. Thank you for coming up here. Please My come pleasure. up more often. It's nice. It's so nice to see you. It's good to be here. In here. Our show today brought to you by WordPress. WordPress, of course, hosts my blog. I used to run my own hosted, self-hosted WordPress, which everybody still can do. But uh, I spent a lot of time messing with it, which was why I had it. And eventually I thought, you know, probably better to spend that time blogging. So I went to WordPress.com. WordPress.com does the hosting. They do the security updates, the patching. And they give me a great-looking blog. With the, WordPress is the best known platform for websites. I'll, I'll tell you how well known. 28% of all websites run on WordPress. 28%. They power the, the entire internet practically. Why? Because it's, it, it's a solid code base that works really well, has universal support. Almost every blogging tool, right out of the box, it's going to work with WordPress. So you have not just the great WordPress content management system that you can enter content into, and that's actually usually what I use, just the web-based version. But their third-party programs, like our friend uh, Daniel Jalkut's uh, Red Sweater blog, his, his Mars, Mars Edit, fantastic, works beautifully with WordPress.com. You're, look, whether you're a blogger or you're a business, and I, you know what, I, we always talk about my blog, but frankly, it's more important for small businesses. You've got to have a website. And where should you start it? At WordPress.com. Make it easier for your customers to find you, connect with you, hear how you can help them. Every single business. You used to be you had to have a Yellow Pages entry. Now, forget the Yellow Pages. You need a, an online home, a WordPress.com website. By the way, it's easy. I know your business is not designing websites. So you don't want to become a webmaster, but you don't need to. You can use WordPress very easily. Go to WordPress.com and click the Get Started button and pick a template and start entering content. It's that simple. But you can also, if you want, there are so many great developers. There's such great third-party support for WordPress. And, of course, a great community of, of people at WordPress.com who will help you, not to mention WordPress's own fantastic support team. I've used them, and they're really good. Boost your visibility. Every single WordPress.com site has search engine optimization. Social sharing, I use that. I mean, that's really important. Not to mention the fact that you can say, follow me on your WordPress site. And and because there's such a big community at WordPress.com, almost instantly, half a million people started following me. It was mind-blowing. 28% of all websites run on WordPress. Find out why. Some of the best, biggest publications on the internet, like Quartz.com, run on WordPress. Get started today with 15% off any new plan purchase. 15% at wordpress.com slash MacBreak. Create your new website. Find the plan that's right for you at wordpress.com slash MacBreak and save 15%. And I just want to thank WordPress for uh, giving me such a great platform. Everybody such a great platform for so many years. Uh, I'm a huge fan. LeoLaporte.com if you want to see my uh, WordPress blog. Mark German. Now at Bloomberg, boy, that was a wasn't that a good acquisition for Bloomberg? Wow, I've heard of him. I've heard of him. He, of course, uh, became famous at uh, Nine to Five Mac. We were quoting, we quote him all the time, uh, probably because he and I. He's a very sweet, humble guy. I saw him at uh, Google I/O this year. Met him for the first time, and I was really impressed by him. But one of the reasons I think people um, like him and talk to him. Uh, because he is such a nice guy, and he gets the best scoops out of Apple. He's got great sources. His story earlier this week, Apple plans to release a cellular-capable watch to break iPhone times. Uh, Intel is said to supply the modem. It works with cell networks. Apple, according to German, plans to sell this new Apple Watch Series 3 this year. Now, I do want to find a little fault with Mark. It's not probably his fault, but he in his interview on Bloomberg and in his article, kind of implied that this is a breakthrough. It's a breakthrough for Apple, but I have to point out others have done this a lot. Samsung and I have an LG uh, Android Wear watch that has uh, its built in. It has its own SIM card, and it allows you to make phone calls as well as uh, access to data. I get the impression from reading Mark's story that this is not for making phone calls. This is really about LTE data, so you can get maps, you can stream music, it's uh, a very delicate battle. Like they've had, as far as I know, and like you never know what that, but they've had 
they've been working on LTE Apple Watches since the before the first Apple Watch came out, and it's always been a question of battery efficiency and thermal. Like the original iPad, the original Apple Watch ran at the thermal limits of that design. You just could not make that device hotter. And subsequently, they you know they made it. They they added more battery because they they have a list of things that they consider to be important to people that they want to solve for, and they added GPS and they added more battery life so people could do the workout and not run out by the end of the day. And sort of cellular is on that list, so I I don't know if it will ship this year. It depends on whether it provides en enough battery life uh, to be you. If it, sorry, if it just came out and suddenly it was a half a day battery life, that'd be a non-starter no. for them. So provided they could provide efficient like sufficient battery life, that watch will ship when they hit that point. It's not just mm. battery life because the 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 phone watches I have from Samsung and LG are massive. Well, theirs is not. See, that's the thing is that, and I think the original <laughs> yep. model of the quote was it would burn your wrist off. Right. So that's not, <laughs> you yeah. don't want that. Also, I think that's part of the future of uh, of Apple Watch. I started. Uh, I, I like the uh, the special June Pride watch band so much that I that, that's what finally got the Apple Watch out of the drawer for the first time in months because I just thought it was a very very pretty band. And it got me, even though I'm not primarily an iPhone user, uh, realizing how good a, how good a fitness watch it is and how good a media watch it is, even if you're just using it with an Android phone, uh, and that's and that's all you're getting from it. So uh, it'd be nice to have uh, a cellular on it, if particularly if it's being used primarily as a data connection as opposed to a voice connection. But if it means that I now have to get uh, another account and another service, if it means that I have to get a, no, a new data plan for my existing service, that wouldn't be a really great move forward, at least not for me. What I think that Apple should really do is move forward just on the basic idea of making this a generic device that will happily talk to any help, any phone that, excuse me, we're obviously talking about, uh, that will happily talk to Android as well as iPhone to uh, take it away from its first generation idea of you're going to have uh, a watch that can work as sort of a terminal for apps that are running on a phone, have everything running directly on the phone, have it just uh, run, have it just connect intermittently to a host phone if it's present just for syncing purposes and for status purposes, but allow people to simply just put this on, uh, play whatever music they want. Uh, get access to fitness information off of any uh, off of any app that they want. Uh, it, that's it, as I think that really needs to go in the same direction as the iPod did, where it was originally a, a Mac only product, and then once you realize that there are only about ten percent or fewer of desktops around the world are Macs, and the ninety percent of the people have money to spend on watches. Perhaps you should sell. Perhaps you should sell to people who have Android phones as well as iPhones as well. And if you really want to get just to the potential of the product, German German says that the phone would probably be sold as, or the watch rather, the phone watch. I guess I should call it would be sold uh, by carriers in carrier stores. That's how they do the uh, other ones: AT and T, Verizon, Sprint, and T Mobile. Uh, the new device could still be delayed beyond 2017. Indeed, the company. This is German talking. Had already postponed. A cellular capable smartwatch last year. Well, and I think that there's there there is an opportunity for you know while it may be a lot of data, being able to walk out with your AirPods and your and your watch. But you could do that now. You just can't get streaming music. You, you can have four games. I mean, it's, 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 it's a, answer the phone though. You know, like you know, not not well, have to reach that's, up. Well, that's and again, he never mentions using it as a phone here. Right. I'm just saying that that would be but, really convenient. But yeah, I mean these these are things that you can easily add. To. I, I can I can give me eighty dollars. I can go on eBay or Amazon and buy a really horrible Chinese watch that can do those things. That will uh, like that can just yeah, be a music player that will also. But no, no, I'm saying I'm saying uh, it's not basic that it, basic. I, I guess it has a feature, but it, it's, it's all it, the, the, saying, the power is always the ecosystem. I mean that's why you don't want to. No, do he's something agreeing else. with you, Alex. He's no, agreeing I'm, with you. Okay. No, I'm about to. I'm about to finish the sentence. Okay. Uh, saying that if all it did was it can act as a Bluetooth, a, a Bluetooth device that can pair to any phone, and when a phone call comes in, here is the phone number, here's the call ID information. Touch this button, and it will act as a hands-free device uh, for answering that phone call. That would make it so much of a nicer. It, it, it's not something that would require Apple-only software to run on an Android device, for instance. Uh, I'm saying that it would be nice if I. Would be able to. Uh, one of the, one of the things that got me so re, re, that rekindled my interest in the Apple Watch was also having AirPods and being able to sync a couple. Uh, excuse me, sync a, a, at least one playlist to the thing, and now rely on that as my music player. Given that I don't need to have 128 gigs of albums with me all the time, I just want to have a couple of important playlists and maybe a few recent podcasts. So it it really did make me reconsider. 
uh, any reconsider how much money Apple might be leaving on the table and how much of the potential of this device that Apple is leaving behind by requiring that there has to be a, an iPhone somewhere right. in the mix. Uh, even I can I can make it work because I do have iPhones. I, I still am an iPhone uh, user intermittently. So when it comes time to copy music onto the device, I can bring up the phone that it's paired with and do that when it comes to updates and stuff like that, I can again produce an iPhone to make that happen. It's just very, very clear to me that these are these seem to be arbitrary decisions for the basic operations of the phone. Uh, and given how well it works for uh, how well the fitness apps built into this watch work, the ability to have all the benefits, the health benefits of the Apple Watch, but also make them available to people who have not bought iPhones would be another step in the direction of Apple really underscoring their idea that we're making products to make people's lives better as opposed to maintain a 41% markup whenever we possibly can. Well, and I, and and I think that for, for me, I, I mean, part of my problem is you know, I have a couple different phones and and the thing is, is, is if I use them at my two different, one iPhone is for when I'm overseas and one iPhone is when I'm local. Uh, the overseas one's but do you want to pay for you know, another like, subscription for your watch? No, what I'm saying is, is that the, the problem right now for me is the one, I can only think it's a big deal to switch phones on my watch. I, I, mean, I have to sit there. You know, I, you know, they said, oh, well, you know, more than one. So you, but see, but this, you wouldn't even need your phone. The idea is the watch does everything the phone does. Right, and I and and, and I you guess to work with an Android phone. What I'd love to be able to do is, is be able to walk out of the house without my phone and know that people can still call me, and right. I can still call them. And if I just say call my wife, and, and it just calls, you know, and that that would. I mean, be there's a lot of problems that are there are different problems that need to be solved, and they they you know I guess they line up what they think are the biggest problems. And one is if you support Android, they've got to line up everything the way they did with iTunes on Windows, and it's right. not overly complicated, but it is something they have to Can't create you and maintain. Use an Apple Watch I don't, with I, I don't buy now? that. Well, no, no, but sorry. So, but also, if, if they believed, like if they believed it was last year or the year before that they were going to get the independent one out, then you know they're putting all their efforts towards getting an i, an i, uh, an Apple Watch out that doesn't need an iPhone or an Android phone, and that might be where they're lying their wood behind. And then oh, it slipped a year, it slipped two years, and the carrier thing is absolutely flummoxing too because we're still they deliver a pizza to your house and they count the amount of people that are going to eat it and charge you more based on that instead of just giving you a pizza and letting anybody you want eat it. And that's my analogy for here's your data, here's your plan. You have whatever phones you want, whatever. I, you know, tablets you want, whatever watches you want, that just all comes from your bucket. Enjoy. And I mean, that's, that's not again, Apple's way of life. doing things. Apple not Apple, the, the, the cellular networks. Right. The, like the cellular networks. It shouldn't matter to them how many devices I have as long as I'm paying for the amount of data that I'm Oh, I see in, charge of the, in terms of an extra subscription. Well, yeah, yeah, Google yeah, Fi works like that. You can buy uh, or rather get a free data SIM from Google Fi and it's all just part of your account. Put it in your yeah. iPad and use Google Fi's uh, service. And a lot, of, a lot of places have family plans. I could definitely imagine someone like T-Mobile saying, you know, you can use your, wa your new watch. LTV it's just like 10 bucks extra per account. month per device right. and or it's something. It's just data. You know, it's, and That's, it's all free. It's oh, now remember we're talking surfing. about the carriers. Seems highly anyway, unlikely. But T-Mobile would be the one that would be the most likely to do that because yeah. they're tends, they tend to be the most aggressive about, yeah. we're just going to make it easy for you to use it. And if they thought also they could over, get a, a leg up, they would. Over the weekend, Gruber said that he heard there's a, a new watch coming this year, a new design. Oh, really? Yeah, that was one of the things he dropped. So that kind of con confirms this idea, and a series three watch with new, we know new software, right? I, with iOS eleven will come to the watch, I presume. Uh, I, I, Apple, yeah, Watch OS four. Uh, four. Watch OS yeah. four. Okay. All right. Yeah. The, 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 the last. Th the one last comment that I, I forgot to make, though, that the other cool thing about when you're not using it, when you're using it as a watch, not necessarily connected to a phone, whether it's an iPhone or an Android device, oh, my God, the battery life on this thing. When it's not <laughs> checking in with the phone, you get days of battery life. It ah. becomes a Fitbit. And that's another reason why I'm thinking, oh, goodness, if the, the, the sooner that Apple makes this a standalone device, kind of like an iPod, where so long as you occasionally bring it to a computer to refresh data or update apps, the better. That's it's it's just so much. Again, I, I just keep I keep coming back to the word potential. It really made me think there's so much potential in this device that isn't being tapped. If it's if it's smart about how it uses the LTE, because of course the iPhone, if it loses signal to to, to its cell towers, uh, it's one of the fastest ways to burn your battery. So this would ground. be the opposite, which is why I think they're being very conservative about the functionality they enable. Is that LTE still does race to sleep very well? So if it can sip data and shut down really fast, it prolongs battery life. Where if it's doing phone calls or streaming Apple Music, it's got to keep that connection on, and that's when you start creating the heat and the battery drain. Right. Mm. I, I'm even talking about without LTE. I'm talking about a first, second, uh, third generation watch that is just just has Wi-Fi is intended to be not something that keeps in communication with a, right. a, 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 a style of usage 
not a new piece of software or a new piece of hardware, but a style of usage that says we are going to support you if you decide that you don't care about connectivity to a phone. Uh, and it's it becomes a really interesting device after that, I think. And because of the idiosyncrasies of, of, of syncing the phone, I, you know, I, I had this thing, I switched phones and then I killed a phone and then I my <laughs> my, my watch was was connected to the phone that I that I had wiped out. And now it doesn't. That's problematic, by the way, with the Apple Watch. They don't. That's, it is. That's hard. You have to. I haven't yeah. done it yet. So I've been. I spent like a month with it. Not connected to anything. It's just a watch. You know, and it does. Yeah, that's you know, a keep people from stealing copy. it. So what you what, you get that from Apple? Well, no. So there's. Uh, I thought he meant the the health data because the health data is one of the few oh. things that still doesn't sync, and you can right. use a utility to copy that off and copy it to another watch or another phone. Oh, I don't care about the data. Yeah, what just, he wants to do is pair his watch to a different phone. But you have to go back yeah. to one phone and release it, and then send it, and then there must be you can unpair it. Yeah, you can unpair it on the watch. You can tell it to erase yeah, all and settings. I just, it's just one of those things I haven't gotten around to. Oh, so but I, you have to. But that's the key. You have to erase the watch to have that. Yeah, to do and that. that's fine. Yeah. I, uh, that, the um, I, I, I've switched the, the watch so many times that losing the data is something right. I'm kind I've, of used I've to. I've done it several times. I just, I'm just looking at. And, you know, it's, it's. I know this is a. So I know this is a tangent, but I was I was out with my phone today, and I got this text from Rogers that said you have used all your data uh, uh. for the month. Uh, and then I got and I ignored it because I was on the road. And then I got another one an hour later that said you have now accrued ninety dollars worth oh. of roaming charges. We're going to shut down your data connection unless you press this button. So I pressed the button, and then I called them. And they said, "Oh yeah, our overage is seventy dollars a gigabyte." Whoa. Uh, and uh, so this, I tweeted it, and this lawyer tweeted back going, yeah, actually, the Canadian government caps it at 50, but when you press that button, you're agreeing to override that cap to 70. And I'm like, I don't have a choice. It's no data, or I override the, the cap. There's no... Ugh. So, I mean, that's... Yeah, cellular companies are still, you know, not... It used not to be that way. I think that, um, like, Verizon and a lot of them are now, like, $10, $10 a gig over it, and we still... Yeah. It's, and, $70 and, a gig was... I gotta tell you, the, it, it's just as bad in Canada. Rogers is just as bad as any of our... Yep. Sell companies. No, These guys worse. will they have no, they have gouge no you at, at at any possible opportunity. I they're, thought he said seven. I asked him three times to repeat the word seventy. Seven zero. Wow. Seventy a gig domestic, not even roaming. Wow. I like Google Fights. Ten dollars a gig. Period. I just want yeah. Whatever you want, more, please. Use as much as you want. I got another SIM for my uh, iPad Mini. Put it because that's one of the few LTE iPads I have. Put it in. Works. It thinks it's on T-Mobile. It's great. That's great. Oh, yeah. by the time I called them, it had gone up to $140. Like, I got the first message, then the second message was $90. By the time I called them, it was $140. Well, and the worst part, yeah. the worst part is, is that, is that a lot of times with the stuff like um, with Facebook, sometimes, you know, uploading images in the background or with that Wi Fi yeah, assist. Instagram, of, Snapchat. I had, I had one month, I had one month, and I was like, I was like, it was, I was getting slowed down because I still have, of course, the old AT&T. Yeah. And I was getting slowed down. I was like, well, how much have I actually used? I looked at my phone. It was like 240 gigs. You know, it was just like, I was like, I okay, want to do brain I'm one of those guys. All that video, right? Like prefetching uh, video. Yeah. My new Lenovo laptop, because I've stopped buying Apple laptops. My new <laughs> Lenovo laptop uh, supports uh, uh, LTE. I didn't get the radio, so I have to open it up. You can buy the radio and plug it in. It just right. clicks in. And then I could use a Google. The reason I didn't do it is because I don't want another full subscription. But once I found out I could just have Google Fi... Get a free SIM, put it in there, and it's the, on my existing account. So that's a good solution. And I've, if the if the carriers do that, I wonder if they will. But if the carriers do that, then I wouldn't mind having a watch with LTE as long as it's part of my existing subscription. I'd buy more data. Right. They'd make more money off. They'd of me. make more money, wouldn't they, in the long run? Yeah. Uh, and by the way, LTE ultimately is going to carry voice. That's going to be the only way voice works. Probably is an LTE in the next year or two. I think all right. of my stuff is voice over LTE yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you're still using probably the, the others, whatever the other tech, you know, CDMA or GSM uh, on a lot of calls, but ultimately it'll all be LTE. And once yeah, because it used to it used to drop to HSPA when you would do right. a voice call because LTE couldn't exactly. transit it, and I've never I haven't seen that anymore. Well, now that's it's a just CDMA LTE. phone. That was one yeah. of the issues of CDMA. Well, no, even GS, GSM CDMA wouldn't let you do voice and data over EVDO, at all. but even LTE wouldn't let you do voice and data oh. at the same time. So you would drop to HSPA on a GSM network oh, in right. order to do the voice. And now with eight with uh, voice over Volte. LTE Volte, yeah. yeah, that's gone too. It's terrific. So I would hope that even if the Apple Watch three Series three isn't voice initially that it would ultimately support fault or like face i mean like facetime and skype and there's so many just a bits a bit yeah <laughs> then you really have a dick tracy one. well facetime audio i mean you know, they, no, they have the audio no i want video you know i have to say i have i have nest cameras uh watching my driveway and if somebody's moving in my driveway i get a picture of them on my apple watch <laughs> that is pretty freaking awesome it's amazing and some of the don't some of the doorbells do that too yeah the ring doorbell will do that too yeah, yeah. that's pretty awesome all right. Uh, 
All right, one question. Poll. We'll poll the chat room, and I'll poll you guys too. If you had a choice between an Apple Watch that used its battery to keep the face on all the time <laughs> or an Apple Watch that used its battery to put an LTE chip in there, which would you choose? All the time. All the time. <laughs> all the time, yeah. All yeah. the time. Like, yeah. Oh, my gosh. All the yeah, Apple? Just, all the time. You get into the thing where you're like this. watch that currently doesn't work as a watch. You see everybody go like this. Yeah. It's like this. And then you have to do the wrist snap because it doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah. if you do too much of a like, like an animal. Like an animal. Oh, we're not it's, animals. Look at the chat room. LTE. Not just that. All the, we gotta, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I'll just say it's not just it's not just that, but us old timers born before two thousand, like there's only there was only one time we were ever programmed to check our watch like this. And that's when like we are at a restaurant and the hostess said, oh, I'm sure we'll have a table for you in the next five minutes. And that was 20 <laughs> minutes ago. And you really want to be rude, say, hi, yes, see, I'm really looking at my watch now, as opposed to I'm having lunch with somebody that I'm enjoying having that time with. And I just need to make sure that I know that I have a train that I have to catch in about 45 minutes. So I don't want to send the message that if I'm doing, I, I want to explicitly say, hi, I'm sorry, I need to check the time and my watch does not work unless I do the rude time check gesture. So we have one vote for L one vote for LTE, and then all the rest for full time, all the time watch face, and then one vote for everything. I want it all. I yeah. want it all and longer battery life, double the battery life, and give me <laughs> yeah. all the features. That's really Apple's but in a challenge right watch. now. They've got to come up with a new because I have to say the two watches I have that have LTE in them are are too uh, big and ugly to wear. The original one was the size of, a, of the original iPhone. The original yeah. Samsung. The LTE Samsung watch. It looked like you had a little phone on your. Uh, yeah. Uh, the one I have, the Android, the new Android Wear one from LG, is still too big and clunky, and yeah. that's because they had to put all that extra battery in there. It's probably also the radio takes yeah. up a little more room too. So yeah, but that's yeah, that, that's why I would love to see us both if it moved in both directions, both make it way, 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 way more connected with an, an LTE model, but also explicitly we are going to knock another another twenty or thirty dollars off the price and make it really, really easy to use it just as a watch, totally separated from whatever else you're doing. Well, as long as we're doing that, why don't we put time travel in there as well? We got the knob. You just oh, yeah. It. Yeah. I'm there. Yeah. I mean, literal time travel, not just on the watch. Like in face. Doctor Strange. I mean, like in Doctor Strange, where he turns his hands and time goes backwards. Oh, I love that. That's Yeah, a, that was awesome. That's, you know, forget flying or invisibility. That's my power. That's my <laughs> secret. We didn't mention oh, that, that services are now the number two revenue generator at yeah. Apple. Yeah. It's iPhone services and all the rest. If you can't make, if you can't get more customers, you get more money from the customers you have. That's a real. Uh, somebody wrote an article I thought was quite good uh, that really, imperceptibly, so 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 lowly, we didn't really notice it. Apple's gone from being a hardware company to being a you know a services, software, and hardware company. I'm like a whole different company. And that is a whole different mindset. It's a whole different way of making money. How does that change Apple? Andy, Andy, <laughs> well, took, a, no, Andy took the first breath. I was gonna, I was gonna say that my, my my first reaction to this is this is kind of like saying that we make we make thirty two billion dollars off of our sales of Coke, Diet Coke, and Moxie. It's like <laughs> okay, I'm guess I'm guessing you're making most. It's the App Store. I, I was I had a, I had to double check it, but like we were estimating last based on uh, Tim Cook's keynote uh, explanation of here's how much money we've handed out to developers in the past year. That was causing us to speculate that uh, rev, Apple revenue from the Apple from the App Store was about twenty eight billion dollars in and of itself last year. That doesn't really indicate how much money they're making off of music, how much money they're making off of storage. Uh, these aren't areas in which Apple dominates. They have a really good presence and really good products, but I really wish they would break that sort of thing down. Um, it's also, but I think that if Apple has one big problem that they hate and would love to solve, it's never it's that of never being able to make and manufacture enough products to sell for all the people who want to buy them. And for them to get back into services allows them to cut out the entire process of manufacture. It allows them to express their design philosophy. And remember, they are a design company as much as they are an engineering company. I don't mean that as an insult. I'm just observing that of the things that drive this company, really great design or design that really appeals to Apple is one of those things. And yeah, I mean, they're. I think that they're as aware as anybody else of the question, what what happens when all of a sudden, all of a sudden, nobody wants to buy Blackberries anymore? Nobody wants to buy phones with keyboards attached to them anymore. Even though 
we were making so much money that we were we didn't have enough denominations of money to burn to start the fire of the pile of money we were burning at the party because we have so much money that we have to get rid of some of it. Uh, what happens when maybe the iPhone becomes just another phone and they don't know exactly what to replace it with? And the answer is to make sure that they have making lots of money off of services. They've seen how much money uh, Google is making from services. They've seen how much money without, excuse me, even uh, getting rid of uh, ad sales. They've seen how much money that Amazon, of all people, is making off of services. They've seen how much money that Microsoft is making. I mean, they have these companies have really nice front facing products, but the thing is they are. They, they make steam pipes and they make a huge amount of money off of steam pipes because every industry is running off of steam these days. So if you really want a, an app, the, an app or a service, you're going to have to buy some capacity from one of these companies that sells ebooks, $50 tablets, sweaters at a discount, and also uh, web app services. So yeah, this is, this is, this is Apple trying to diversify itself, trying to make sure that it's got as many revenue streams as possible to try to future proof its, its, its success as much as possible. And I think we're certainly going to see more of this. It's also interesting to me because there was a big debate previously whether Apple was a software or hardware company, and it started to strike me that it's not really even a, it's not either of those things. It's not even really a product company. It's a differentiated experiences company, and increasingly you need services to provide that. Like they they figure out what they want to do, and services is an increasing part of that. And now the threats are coming from services. Like if you look at WeChat in China, it's become such a big platform that it just abstracts away even the hardware, software, and other services underneath it. And if you want to protect yourself and protect and like Andy said, your company, you have to start offering services that are as important to people. Whatever people see first, that doesn't matter what the pipes are. The interface is the application. Uh, the display is the hardware. All of those things. You've got to give them something that keeps them on that platform. Actually, uh, somebody in the chat room pointed out that although iPhone sales revenue went down in China, app store sales went through the roof. And that shows you where services can even out revenue. Uh, even in a place where you're not selling the hardware, having all those WeChat downloads. Yeah, I do think that they're all <laughs> as, as as Renee was saying. It, it I think the services are less about revenue to Apple and more about creating a powerful ecosystem that everyone stays tied into. You know that that there well, is it certainly works. You know, I think that it works. Yeah. And they're making a lot of money on it, but I think that they're. But I think that the primary reason that they're doing the services um, is to make sure that you're that you stay attached to yeah. this entire ecosystem. Make well, it I think that's how it started. But now they're making now it's, two, now 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 it's become billions, more of a focus. So <laughs> why, yeah. why not keep? Oh, no, I think I I think it's I think it's like a revenue capacitor where it really just evens out. Exactly. We were talking earlier. We were, we were talking earlier about how uh, revenue from let's say hardware it spikes on release and spikes on release and spikes on release and spikes on release. And that's there's no problem with that so long as that's not the only way you're making money. When you're selling apps, you're selling apps to everybody who has ever bought an Apple device and they're not waiting for the next version of Lightroom. They're not, not waiting for the next version of their HP 65 calculator app to come out. They're always, there's a steady flow of revenue coming in from at least this source. And if that source is in the tens of billions of dollars, that's that's a, that's an umbrella for a rainy day. Did we talk last week about Vic Gundotra's post on uh, Facebook? <laughs> I can't remember if you weren't here. I don't, don't no, know. I don't I, think we did. Let's talk. It, it came out last week, exactly. But let's uh, let's talk about uh, the guy who started Google Plus posting on Facebook to say you don't want an Android phone, just get an iPhone. We'll talk about that in just a second, and that'll be a good segue into your article on iPhone photography and iOS 11. But first, I want you, Alex, to smell that. Oh, that smells good. That's good. It does. Mm, how about this? Smell this. Smell this. And look at my hair while you're smelling it. <laughs> Quite nice. I would make you smell my hair, but <laughs> you could smell that, and that's what give you. This is the uh, this is the Wanderer hydrating sage and black pepper. See, for a man, you don't want to smell like that's perfume. Right, that's the right. You smell. want to smell like sage and black pepper. <laughs> <laughs> this is the shampoo, and uh, this is the body cleanser and sulfate. I love this sulfate free, no parabens. Uh, no synthetic dyes. This is a new product from Dollar Shave Club, our sponsor, Dollar Shave Club. But you Club. use it even when you're not shaving your head. Yeah, right. No, this is right. <laughs> this is this is your body wash. And this is your shampoo. What I like about Dollar Shave Club, they've kind of pioneered the idea of getting subscribing to get your personal care products uh, in the mail, so you don't have to think about having a new razor blade. I really that was a revolution for me. The idea that I always had a fresh razor blade. I changed my razor blades on Monday. And I always have. I always know I've got a fresh razor blade, so I don't. I don't cut myself. By the way, one of the things I love about Dollar Shave Club, 
I don't. I have to do some. I'm going to find somebody who tests this. But it's my opinion they are the sharpest blades on the market today. And you might say, I don't want a sharp blade. But you do want a sharp blade. You're going to cut yourself less. It's like having a good cooking knife versus a dull cooking knife. You're going to cut yourself less. You're going to get a closer shave. And you're not going to get as much pulling if the blade is sharp. And I think Dollar Shave Club's blades are the best. They are absolutely the sharpest. Dollar Shave Club is the smarter choice. A great shave at a great price. Conveniently delivered right to your door. It's just a, this is a life hack, folks. You don't have to schlep to the store to buy a... God, don't ever do this. Get one of those blue-handled, cheap, disposable razors. But that is... You want to know what a bad shave is? Use one of those razors once. No. I have my Dollar Shave Club executive razor. I use the Dollar Shave Club shave butter from Dr. Carver. Oh, that is the nicest stuff. It's transparent, which is a weird feature. But you can actually see what you're shaving. You're not shaving through this fog of war we call shave cream i love it and it gives you not only a better shave but it prevents ingrown hairs it fights razor bumps and it smells and feels great your skin is softer after you shave make the smarter choice join dollar shave club we've got a great deal for you for a limited time if you're a new member you can get this kit for a mere five dollars plus free shipping uh, the kit includes the executive handle which is a very nice weighted handle with a grip, but it's made out of metal. It's really solid. You get four blades, four of the great Dollar Shave blades. And by the way, these are, you know, everything you want in a cartridge. Plus the blade in the back that gives you the little trimmer for the hard-to-reach places. I really value that and the lubricating strip. You get that and a full-size tube of Dr. Carver's Easy Shave Butter, Formula 6301-1. By the way, that formula number has never changed. I keep waiting for Dash 2, but they never upgrade it. They don't need to. It's perfect. When something's perfect. And incidentally, every time you get it, I know, again, they don't advertise this, but I love the bathroom minutes. There's a little magazine in every box. So every time you get your new box, it's got all this sort of fun little stuff in here. It's really quite good. It's kind of like the old farmer's almanac. And in a pinch, you could use it for toilet paper. That is, <laughs> that is the Dollar Shave Club Executive Razor plus Shave Butter plus blades just five dollars isn't that nice and of course after your first month you get your replacement blades automatically this is everything you need for a month at the regular price no hidden fees no commitments you can cancel easily anytime you like and you can only get this at our site dollarshaveclub.com slash mac break dollar shave club please use that so they know you saw it here dollarshaveclub.com slash mac break but while you're while you're browsing around, take a look. They have a bunch of other products, including those butt wipes, which I, well, let's not talk too much about that, but I do. They, say, they have butt wipes? Yeah, and they're, um, <laughs> so you and I have Japanese toilets. Which are awesome. So we don't need these. But when you travel, don't you miss? Yes. You miss the hydrating action. Uh, you feel unclean. You know, you know I mean, yeah, this is the best thing. The best thing there was, there was N NPR had the best thing. They were talking about someone who deals with uh, sewage systems all over the world to make sure. And, and they asked her, they said, we have to ask you, what do you use? And she goes, oh, I have a Japanese toilet. And he goes, because I don't dry my dishes with a paper towel. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Plus, we, you know, we're on septic. Right. And it's so much better for the septic. Right. Uh, anyway, I can go on and on. But these, but when I travel, <laughs> I really feel, I feel bad when I travel. Because I don't have the one wipe Charlie, so I I mean don't have the uh, the bidet, so I get the one wipe Charlies, and these are really great. They have a lot of nice little products like that, the post shave cream and so forth. But um, are they pepper scented? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> you know that's a good question. You want you want it? No, no, <laughs> I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to say it. You can't get it. They also have Boogie's hair styling cream, which I or hair pomade, which I use. The Boogie's is quite nice. Uh, <laughs> kind of weirdly named. Uh, the good shake hand cream. So they're a lot. They've gone way past the whole. Uh, yeah, this is uh, this I is. I love that they just say butt wipes. But what? Hey, you know what? Dollar Shave Club. They don't mess around. They're not gonna namby pamby. This is it, and it's what you need. Aloe vera and chamomile. So I I do highly recommend the Japanese toilet, but these are a lot less expensive <laughs> <laughs> and require no plumbing. All right, let me put that away. Thank you, Dollar Shave Club. DollarShaveClub.com slash Mac Break. Vic Kundotra, who uh, started at Microsoft, he went to Google, he, uh, he lobbied for Google to get social and created Google+. Plus. Then when Google+, Plus flopped, he mysteriously disappeared. He's resurfaced, actually, at a great company, well, he, which I highly recommend, called Cardia. What's where, Cardia? Uh, oh, 
this is you well you don't need it yet but as you get older you're going to need it jeff jarvis uses this if you've ever had it's from alive core is the company if you've ever had um a fib uh this is a in your pocket ekg that works with your phone i just want to get it for fun it's fda approved it's 99 bucks it's cheap and yeah, I got it for fun because I don't have a like, How am I doing now? But I got it for fun, and you can they will give you a diagnosis, or you could send it to your doctor for a fee. Uh, and it's FDA approved, which is one of the few one of these health devices that is uh, you know FDA approved. It's an EKG. It's you can carry in your pocket, or attach it to the back of your phone. They now now they now just have to be able to you just have to put it on your chest and go clear, and just push the two <laughs> buttons. And that was the next thing. <laughs> a, a defibrillator. Yeah. But if you catch sometimes AFib, you can't tell. Right. So if you if you if you know, and 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 of course Jarvis, who's been hospitalized twice for it, um, he carries this all the time, and his doctor says this is great. Anyway, that's Vic's new company. All praise to Vic Gundotra. However, that was a big jump from, from uh, Leo from was he the one who also said that we can't we can't have a world where one man and one phone dictates the future. Like he had his whole screed against Steve Jobs. <laughs> Probably I he think was, that was him. he was Google's interface on the Google Apps with Steve Jobs. Yeah. He likes to. As Chief Pass, he wrote a very moving eulogy. He told some About great the color stories. color yellow, right? Yeah, right. wrong color yellow. Yeah. yeah. Jobs called yeah. him. Uh, he was at services on a Sunday and said, and, and Vic didn't answer, but he later talked to him and said, the color in the O is wrong on the Google app. <laughs> <laughs> it's the wrong color. It's like. <laughs> oh, but he's got a history of saying bombastic things in public. Yeah. But Vic is awesome. And he, but he does. And this is a bombastic thing. He posts not on Google Plus, but on Facebook. <laughs> First dig. The end of DSLR for most people has already arrived. I left my professional camera at home and took these shots at dinner with my iPhone 7 using computational photography, portrait mode, as Apple calls it. Hard, hard not to call these results in a restaurant on a mobile phone with no flash. Stunning. And I agree. These are, these are great pictures of his daughters. And it says, great job, Apple. And later in a comment, he says, nobody should get an Android phone. This is just the only yeah. way to go. This I might that's disagree with. Edges are the we know the, you know, like You see the edge yeah. problem here with yeah. the back of the hair? The hair... The hair suddenly goes out of focus, even though it's really in the same focal plane. Uh, that's part of the problem with portrait. But you know what? In, no, but most people don't know that or care Emotionally, about it. it feels good. Emotionally, that is yeah. a picture of your daughters you will love for the rest of your life, right? And that's an iPhone. Yeah. So I think a number of people disagreed with him about the DSLRs and uh, disagreed with him about uh, Android photography. But his point really is... Isn't it amazing what we can do now, thanks to, with small lenses and small sensors, thanks to computational photography? And on yeah. that, I think that point is well taken. Yeah, yeah and it yeah. sounds like Apple's going to be doing... Uh, uh, one of the issues people had with him is that he was giving Apple all the credit for computational photography, where they believed that Google was a pioneer with Auto Awesome, which came about because Google never really knew what hardware you had on a phone. So all they could right. do was sort of suck everything up and make it look as good as possible on right. their servers. And now the rumor is Apple's going to be doing a version of Auto Awesome, but on device for people who just aren't comfortable with the service. And once a again, a well, huge advantage to Apple... Because it makes the hardware and the software. It knows what you have. It's built into the image signal processor on the phone. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, it was a, I thought it was a really odd thing for him to be talking about, given that uh, on device, Google has had a, a system they call HDR+, which goes well beyond what simple HDR does. I mean, as, as it happened just a week or two before that, I took one of my walks through Boston with a pocket full of phones because I had, I think, two new devices. And as usual, I just take a walk through Boston uh, with a bunch of phones and cameras that I know how they react in all these places that I usually take pictures at, taking the exact same pictures six times with six different cameras, including uh, the latest Galaxy S8, the latest iPhone, uh, my the my Panasonic LX10, which I really, really love, which is a like quote real unquote camera, uh, and my two year old uh, my two year old Android phone uh, over here, and uh, and a what was I think a three hundred dollar Asus uh, Asus phone, and just taking the exact same pictures time and time again. There was a twist this time that I hadn't really counted on, because uh, all of them I turned on a couple of different Google Photos auto upload features. That in the meantime that I hadn't, I forgot I'd turn on, which meant that when I went to Google Photos uh, after being back home for about ten minutes and things found Wi-Fi again, I suddenly had the uh, the my camera roll was six copies of this exact same picture, and I couldn't tell which camera had taken which one because you know you can't you have to I have to click the an info button to get yeah. that information. So I decided, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to simply pick the one I like. I create a brand new shared photo album uh, called my uh, Boston Walk or whatever. 
And I'm just going to simply, without looking at the identity of these cameras, I'm going to just pick the best, the one I like, uh, the best of all of them. And I was expecting to see, uh, there's some things I expected to see, but what I didn't expect to see is that overwhelmingly my favorite camera, the, the, the camera that took my favorite pictures was my two-year-old Nexus 6P made in 2015 uh, it was uh, that had it was the only phone of the lot that had access to uh, the stock Android camera app and HDR plus. So it was beating the iPhone 7. It was beating the brand new Galaxy S8. It was beating even again this $600 camera that again I love. Uh, and so it really did reinforce for me that computational photography is the great influence is is really the, the, the one of the biggest things you can add to uh, any phone. That maybe the lens is not important, maybe the sensor isn't important, maybe even the onboard image processing isn't as important as just simply decide, recognizing that, oh, that's a blue sky. People like blue skies to be blue. I will make that sky blue. So that's it's 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 something to think about. I, I should I should qualify, though, before uh, ending this, that my rules for when I take these photo walks is that I don't get to interact with the camera at all. I, I felt I feel as though because different camera, different phones have different software features the only fair way to do it is to keep it on completely automatic so if the, the phone has the option of doing hdr if it wants to do hdr uh all i can do is just simply hold it up and press the press the shutter button uh so obviously the difference between so so, so I, I would disagree with the idea that this that means that this camera is not is just as good as the the camera in my phone the difference is that if i want to actually this camera by the way is panas as the cameras that uh, andy's recommended before the panasonic lumix lx10 yeah it's a, it's a little it's Excellent a little pocket camera shoot. that yeah. i bought i bought it when i was so temp i was so impressed with the iphone 7 last year and so impressed with the google pixel phone that i thought maybe i should buy an iphone 7 mm -hmm. just as a walking around like pocket camera and then said, "You idiot! An iPhone That's seven half. will cost you seven. Yeah. It costs seven hundred dollars. <laughs> this you can buy a real camera with this actual optical zoom lens right. and a flash for that. But but the but the point is that I think that the next real revolution is not going to be about, hey, look how big the sensor is, or hey, look of this wonderful, exploded diagram of how intricate our lens system is. It's going to be here is how much processing that we will do. That's based not just simply on." High exposure, low exposure, average them out. But at understanding that this is a picture of a statue, the statue is made out of bronze. Bronze has has really really deep shadow, hot dark parts that has that have to be elevated out. So that's it's. That's, yeah, I just thought was, it was really weird that Kondotra was making that point, given I that think, Android is probably the best. Exactly. <laughs> there was a, had he not been you know. so bitter about Google, I think he he would have. He knows perfectly well that there was a great this comment. This all done and I at don't, Google, you know. Go ahead. I don't remember who said it, but there was a great comment that said that previously it was all the algorithm guys that ruled this industry and they would work on the pixels. It's just like, you know, separate the colors and find the edges. And now it's all the machine learning guys who have taken over uh, this product at all the companies. Exactly. And they're trying to say this is this is not brown. This is a mountain. This is not blue. This is a sky. It's not white. It's clouds. And this is what we know about these things. And they should look. This is the idealized way they should look. And they're doing exactly what Andy said. And I think the shift now is towards computational systems that can also ingest a lot of data, like why you're getting two lenses or why you're maybe going to start getting those 3D sensors or laser arrays inside the cameras so they can ingest as much information about the world as possible to make better choices and then sort of recreate uh, a reality inside the picture that's as good as it possibly can and be. credit yeah. to Mark Lavoie, who is uh, at Google Research and is their head of computational photography. And he started doing this with a jump camera, their VR camera, the Google Glass. He had some very challenging physical limitations and they got better and better and better at uh, handling it computationally to take kind of an imperfect optical shot and make it a much uh, better shot. So uh, you're right. Scene I think detection it, instead of just face detection. Exactly. Just as Andy yeah. was, was yeah. talking about. As a, as a matter of fact, just to think, it might have been just a couple of days before this came out, uh, there was a new research paper that uh, Google Research, working with MIT, uh, was talking about an, an AI algorithm they had done where they you teach the AI by saying, here are 5,000 pictures and here are 5,000 versions of that picture that have been edited by real human beings. And so that gives them that experience that a real human being, if they were fixing this, would sharpen this a little bit, but not a whole lot. They would increase the brightness, but not so much that those, there's a halo around the sun. Uh, and the idea of, and on top of all that, not it's not just a post-processing thing. Uh, the algorithm is built so that if it's on sufficiently good hardware, it'll actually just, this is the preview image you will get. You will get the optimized image in preview. So that's really is where things are going, not just the mathematics that says that you, you can do, you can mathematically and procedurally look at the histogram. Like here is the chart of where all the light values are. 
and realize that, okay, there's almost no black tones, there's almost no white tones, so let's make sure that there's a little bit more of a spread there. It, we're talking about, no, this is how a human this is how a human being would want this to look like. So and, that's why and I should point Apple's out, Libre this is not cool. unique to Google and Apple. I mean, Sony and other companies are doing computational photography in their high-end cameras. Actually, that's where Nikon and Canon are being, I think, a little bit left behind. This is the Sony A9, where it's both it's hardware and software. They're right. providing amazing... Uh, new stacked, you know, full frame chips, but then yeah. they're also backing it up with computational photography. This is a picture I took a lot of camera gear with me to Machu Picchu. This is a picture I took at Machu Picchu with my Google Pixel and HDR Plus turned on. It's one of the best pictures I took, and it was with a Amazing. camera phone, not with my, you know, Canon 5D Mark IV. So I do think that uh, there's a Vic has a lot of merit in what Vic says. Computa bottom line, computational photography yeah. is the future, but I'm not throwing away my DSLR. Well, uh, yeah. It's happening there, too. Well, and, and I think that, uh, especially for, for landscape shots, the difference yeah, between moving. the difference between um, uh, the DSLR and the, and the phone drops dramatically. Yeah. Um, you know, low light, it starts to show up. We, you know, there is a certain amount of physics, you know, so one of the things Canon has done is they have a, what's called an ME20 video camera. That um, and we have an ME two hundred, which is kind of the smaller version of it. It's interesting. Canon's really making most progress in video now, isn't it? Yeah, they're doing a lot of interesting yeah. things with video. I mean, yeah. they we we only use them as so we're pretty much a black magic house at this point, except for these Canon cameras, which are extremely good at low light. The ME twenty will pretty much you can shoot at night. Is that I mean, computational like or that's just a big? It's a shit. mixture. It's a, it's so what yeah. they, they did two things. One is is that they took a full size sensor. Yeah. And in ours is a super thirty five, and they just said, okay, it's gonna be nineteen twenty by ten eighty. So right. it's you know, and lots and, and, of but that, lots so, of area. So it's like very I, few pixels, it's giant yeah. Yeah. micron, you know, like giant sensors. Yeah. Um, you know, um, so each photo site is really big, and as a result, you know, the 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 ISO goes to like four million. You know, and and <laughs> and, uh, and we worked on a show where there was a lot of these ME twenties being used in at two a.m. You know, in Africa, you know, and we're getting these live feeds, and it just looks like you know, it it doesn't look like the sun but it looks like it's you know uh, early morning or whatever and you can see all the color you can see everything there it was it was kind of uh it's kind of amazing you know and the and the the me20s are about 20 grand and the you know the me200 are, are five grand but they're but they're still you know that is taking advantage of physics and then you add they added of course on top of that a ton of computation right. to pull that right. out you know it's not yeah. it's not one or the other and admittedly this is an order of magnitude more expensive than an iphone 7 plus and probably isn't in order to. Bend and it's not in your better. pocket all the time. And it's not in my pocket. That's I mean, the also, big thing. But I. But so, a serious photographer is going to carry a pocket camera like Andy and a, right. and a bigger camera, and maybe even a camera phone. And I think increasingly, the 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 kind of um, perf, pro point and shoots that photographers bought are slowing yeah. down a little bit because a lot oh, of Oh yeah, I mean to me there's I don't need that. you have I've to got, you have to right. I, I think that I think it's the difference between the the people there are a lot of people who would buy like a $500 Nikon SLR because there are types of shots that they wanted to take that would require that kind of a camera, not because they really wanted to be fancy fancy photographers. Right. Now, the people who need an SLR that's few and far between. I don't I don't think I think there are advantages to having a, a nice camera, but you can get you can the the promise particularly of an iPhone. This this is the one area in which I absolutely think that the iPhone is the best camera uh, you can you can possibly get is because no other phone camera is as good at the idea of I'm going to aim this I'm going to press right. this button and it's going to give me a picture that will never be less than good. Um, and I'll, but the, the the remember also also remember that there's a factor of the software you've got on your on your phone itself or uh, on your desktop, where Snapseed is just amazing. It's a, a the free, Google's free uh, image processing app. There are times where I am I am home and I'm in Photoshop and Lightroom trying to reproduce the results I got just by twiddling it around in five or ten minutes with Snapseed. And then there's the idea of there's a a picture that I took in Harvard Square in like 1993 1994 with one of my first digital cameras uh, of a street performer who later on turned out became a super super famous performer and she wanted to use this picture that I'd taken like in a, in a TED talk she was giving uh, that went on to become a huge TED talk and I was is the first I, I've managed to find my original my original uh, two or three megapixel JPEG and by using modern apps modern apps for HDR modern apps for uh, uh, for removing noise 
I was amazed at what I could do just in 30 seconds. As, uh, yeah, 30 seconds and even 30 minutes to take a picture that had a huge number of defects, but then there was enough data inside there that a modern app could quickly tease out and figure out what the structure of this picture is and sort of into it where I was trying to go, like what, what my intent was while I'm trying to improve it. So don't the, the bottom line is don't worry too much about what kind of a camera you're using. Yeah, I, I, I the, think you're right. The, as long as you got enough data, there's you can do something with it. This is a red. Always save folks, your originals. The folks who did the red camera announced this crazy twelve hundred, or I'm sorry, fifteen hundred dollar. It's fifteen hundred for the titanium, I think. Hydrogen one phone, um, but it won't be out till next year. Uh, would anybody? Because of course they did. Yeah, who, because of course. Who would buy that? Who would? Who would? Who would be crazy? You. Enough to buy you would buy it. You know that. I was on the list. You were on the list instantly. In the first 10 huh? seconds. I was like, really? I was like, I don't even know what it does. I'm buying it. <laughs> if it's a phone and it's from In red, red, I'm, I'm getting it. it. Oh, Marcus Brownlee's uh, reviewing it yeah. here. He still, I think, wasn't allowed to show it. Like, none of us really know what it is. Like, it, it's like, it's like it does something great, and we don't. And, and, and we Red, Red is one of the few is. companies like Apple. Yeah, he that wasn't allowed to show the holographic display, right? That was right, it's got a holographic display. Oh, who cares about that, right? It's kind of well. It's I, I think it's kind of. Ugly. It looks like a droid. It's something you'd want, though, right? It's kind of. I, I still fit it in my pocket. There didn't seem to be. I like any the I like problems, the industrial look of it. Obviously, yeah. this will turn into a two-handed phone for a lot of people. And then the camera bump on the back. Definitely look at the size more of, a of that bump. Placeholder than an indicator of what the module will actually look like on the inside. Oh. but it's still pretty big. Definitely it's they, so it's too, it's yeah. too early. In other words, this but is just. He had, some, he had to, they showed him two or three models. One is just right. here is the design prototype. One that was functional that looked nothing like the design prototype. Right. And then I think there was a mystery device that just that had the holographic stuff working on it. But it, 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 that's interesting. It does point out that there are so many people for whom it really isn't a case of getting good pictures. They are videographers. They are journalists. And this is the device that they carry into a situation because who wants to carry 80 pounds worth of stuff if uh, you can well, buy something. If for $500, you can get something that will give you the video that you need, give you the mobility you need, give you the height ability that you need. So uh, do they take, bucks is do they take your money already or do they just... Uh, I had to I, I had to get into some... I, I'm, I'm, I, I, actually I had to give remember. them some money, it says. Yeah, I had it's fifteen ninety five for the titanium and you could just get like aluminum for eleven ninety five. but who would Save want... Save a few by now. Yeah. Who would want that? <laughs> Let me just see if they want money. Order now. I'm just glad to see... I don't think I had to put money down. I think I just got on the list. You could I'm just you glad could. to see a, a physical phone design that's at least interesting. That's not a hey, look. We I mean, now, I gave now, a for, 20, card, now, now for 2017, the rounded rectangle. The radius is a little bit larger than it was the last time, but it's still a rounded rectangle. Okay. I think that's I think nice. I, I think I gave the credit card, and I think that that means that you know I, I won't. You're gonna I get won't bills. get charged. But as soon as I get charged, that'll be the time that I have to explain to my wife. Why. Yeah, you, you got a little pass. It came with. It came what with, is uh, this order for? Did you buy another camera? No, of course not. I, mean, I didn't buy another camera. It probably, the thing is, why make it a phone at all? Oh, because it, 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 again, it, it gives you, if it's, you want um, data and, yeah. yeah, I mean, you can get the data, you can, you know, it, it replaces something. You can, you can now yeah. go out with only that and, and shoot it. I think it makes a lot of sense. And you look like right. a badass, Neil. Yeah. It's not, not, it, 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 it can hardly be overstated uh, uh, how uh, this this is a, this is a legitimate journalistic tool now. Oh, when you, I was, to, that's true. We were in. Uh, the ability, the it really is like. Remember the remember the Max Headroom TV show like from from the from the 1980s where uh, Edison Carter has like this big Sony Beta cam that has this miraculous antenna that can actually broadcast from wherever he is and now we've actually got it. There are people that I'm gonna be, I'm, it's not enough for me to record this video. I have to make sure that this video leaves this device and goes someplace safe before people with clubs <laughs> discover that I'm well, not simply a tourist. I'm someone who's won a Pulitzer. So we were at, we were in in Switzerland at a big a big event and. Um, like half the journalists were just running around with iPhones, you yeah. know, like that was, you know, that they were out there shooting their streaming to Even Facebook for live. Video. And, I mean, well, shoot streaming to Facebook live and you yeah. throw, and especially you take one of those iPhones and you put it onto the Osmo mobile. Yeah. And you're sitting there Which running around and yeah. it's got a gimbal. And so you're, you're running around and, and doing these, these interviews and we've built some pretty complex rigs for the, for the iPhone. So you can get XLR in wireless, you, get, you hook your wireless <laughs> to it, you got lights and you're like this little thing. You hold it, but, you're just nuts. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's like, but it's like got a, a Canon ME and an iPhone. An iPhone, <laughs> and, and here's the funny thing: Rigs. my rig, my 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 iPhone rig costs more than the Canon at, uh, ME 200. You know, so so, but it's um, but it's like you know, you can basically build all of this stuff into it with the right you know bits and pieces of it. And uh, I got and, the Osmo. And, Should I? Uh, 
Should I use that to, to like... One of the coolest things to do with the Osmo, and I have kind of all of the Osmos, so yeah. um, one of the cooler things to do with an Osmo is take it, if you have a sunroof, just take it and hang it out the sunroof. Now, you have to kind of push up against it. Now, you can also now get... Um, we got these little suction cups for it, um, but the... Uh, it just it's like you're floating through a town. I, I shot in I was in Cambodia and just stuck the stuck it out the top. And it was like floating through these little villages. It's just amazing. Um, but uh, it's it you charge now that's the charge, oh, this is the that's the little one I think that's the that's that the one the I have the handheld one. Oh, so well, there's, there's there's a there's that one and then there's one that's the that's got the Zen Moose Five I think on it. That's a bigger version of that. Oh. And then there's the iPhone one and then there you know there's they've got a bunch of different versions. Um, because the, there's one that's like the the Osmo Pro, I think. Oh yeah, is, this one has a built-in camera, but then I I got the one that has the one that doesn't have a camera because you just put your <laughs> iPhone on it. Right. That the I I have, and that's the one I can't kind of throw in my bag. I mean, that's I don't carry this one around that much. I use that one for shooting other things. Yeah. So um, and the other thing is, is that with the Pro one, you can take that off and put it on the bottom of like a Inspire, which is so you get kind of. It's this. from the same company. It's a DJI. Phantom Company, and I think we have. I think somehow we've uh, accumulated most of what DJI makes, so we kind of are on playing <laughs> playing with. Shocked. Those. I Shocked. just. Uh, I was just playing. I was uh, flying uh, the the Mavic. I got. I have the Mavic. Uh, uh, can you mount the robot arm on the drone and then fly the phone around? This you is cannot. The, yeah, this yeah, is that way. This is the one I got. The Osmo Mobile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it's great. It's a U, probably. The yeah, only bummer pretty, about pretty it is, is that you can't. You can't plug in the uh the lightning goes the lightning's on the wrong side like you want to be right. able to have it and the, so the bummer about that is that you, you can't power it while you're using it well power is one thing but the other thing is we use when we want to stream from an iphone is we use we hook it to ethernet yeah so then we have super solid can't super put it in upside solid down function. yeah because you Ethernet's can't put it the way to go down it's still 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 the way to go when you're streaming is you can't put lines. the camera in upside down it's so a phone in upside down Alex? no, no you can do to... it upside down you can okay the osmo yeah absolutely you can rig it you can rig it uh, right side up or upside down. It's it, but it, it's, doesn't it still the have to hold it? It still no, no, covers. You still hold it, but you can. We mounted port it. Lightning port still covered though. But oh yeah. Oh no. Yeah, no. No. You, you, the lightning board oh, okay. has to. Yeah. You have to <clears throat> mount it. Too bad. It, it does yeah. go in that it way. It is a weird. That is a weird choice, isn't it? I don't know why well, they uh, probably to keep people from us well. doing that because it probably would be bad for the for the uh, gimbal. Yeah. That's probably why they did it, but it's still annoying. Oh, because you have something attached. You don't want to attach anything. I know. Yeah. Yeah. They should give you a lightning out. <laughs> at the bottom of the gimbal or something maybe yeah. like you know like that yeah i mean and you can try to and the, the hard part is just you know wi-fi is is not a very you know you're yeah it's not a great sol solution so let's talk about <laughs> sorry alex it just makes me spend money that's all let's talk about uh ios 11 helps you shoot photos straight from the heart this is renee ritchie's uh long piece that he did uh this is why he wasn't here last week uh uh, about how iOS 11 is going to change uh, how camera works on iPhone 7 or any any iPhone, right? So what's going to be yeah. new in iOS 11? So, I mean, there's, there's part of it that's new just for the iPhone 7 Plus and for whatever other dual camera systems Apple puts out this fall, and that is the portrait mode has gotten a lot more powerful. Previously, it was tuned mostly for facial recognition, and you could get away with shooting things like coffee, which I kept doing, but you know it wasn't perfect, and it had trouble with some reflections and angles and things, and now it does a much better job. It's tuned for, for flowers. Even uh, I did a shot of a fence there where it, it, it picks up the fence and then blurs everything behind the fence. So it's gotten much more sophisticated in what it can do, and one of the really cool things Things is with Apple's new Heath, the high efficiency image format, is it keeps the depth data separate. It doesn't burn it in anymore into so the image. They're replacing JPEG with yes. Heath. Yes, H -E -I -F. which is like F. It's like the H.265 version of, of JPEG. So it's it's, it's more compact, more compact than JPEG? And it's, yeah, so it, it does take slightly longer to process, but for video, that's more of a deal than it is for images. Images are still lightning fast, and it gives you better compression, but mostly it bundles things together. So instead of having live photos that have a separate JPEG and movie file, it's just the data is there together. Instead that's of having nice. a copy of the depth photo and a, where the depth is burned in and a regular, you have a, a photo that has the depth data. So you can get the blur effect, but also a filter, for example, could apply things based on the depth data, like this, the new silver tone uh, filter in iOS 11. It will change the way it processes the filter based on the depth data contained in the Here's photo. Here's an example you took of, are these your nieces of two? My God, my God, God kids. kids. So yeah. there, there, there's a difference in contrast even from the foreground and the background. 
Yeah, and that's, they're calling it the Depthy API. So that's available to developers too, so they can start doing things with the different um, depth data. Isn't that interesting? And I don't. You, you'd have to use regions in Lightroom to do this. This would be, this would be a, a significant amount of time to to make it look like this. That's a very interesting effect, and I like it. I think it's a really yeah, I mean, nice it's just, effect. It's it's one of the things that get they get from having a format, so you can pull these photos over to your Mac or to your iPad and completely well, change the, issue, the way the depth is being. So HEIF is a standard. Yes, but no and one it supports it. <laughs> no, and Except there's APIs. So the hope is the hope is that you know, like with a lot of these things, that the uh, the adoption will. I mean, we're still using GIF from GIF GIF from the yeah. the CompuServe. So days, probably so. what you would do is you would capture it in HEIF process it on the iPhone and export a JPEG for posting on Instagram or anywhere else. Is that and there's some hope that Adobe and other companies will support it, like even do things like turn it into an alpha layer so that you can do a lot of different things with it. Ooh, um, so interesting. Yeah, using that, I mean, you, we were talking a little bit, but the, uh, using that grayscale, whether it's in compositing in After Effects or Photoshop, there's a lot of filters that can take advantage of a grayscale image that's giving you depth information for either, um, there's actually, I think when you do the lens blur in Photoshop, in Photoshop it already asks you, I mean, there's a drop down that says, give me a black and white that gives me the depth and I can, you know, do that. So there's a bunch of options there. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and then for uh, live photos, it's one of those things, it's almost Microsoftian, you know, when they put out something that nobody really understands and then it gets better and better and better over the years. And live photos is sort of like that now because it's not just you take a photo and you get a little bit of animation on each side. They've made live photos a lot better where you have, again, that single container, but it also, the quality is so high now that you can choose any frame as the keyframe and you can start, you can crop them and you can edit them. And this has a bunch of fun effects, almost like Instagram, but that's, you're not bound to the social network. Yeah. Yeah, this is bounce. They're calling it bounce because I yeah. guess boomerang was taken. So this just, you know, <laughs> it, it goes in and out and there's fade and there's loop uh, and it does long exposure too. So if you're, if you're doing a different, uh, so if you're taking traffic going by or light streaming by, you can press the long exposure button and it'll That's pull cool. it out and motion blur is it. This, uh, is this in the camera app itself? In the so in the camera app and the photos app because they're sort of blended a little bit together. So you just swipe you swipe up on the photo that you've just taken and you can add uh, all these effects to it. And it's it's based on the same live photo data and it stays editable. So, so this, you can this do is this the loop filter then, we're looking at, which is how is this different than the bounce filter? Oh, it's just going. It's a loop. It goes in a certain the bounce. I'm switching between the two there because it, again it's non-destructive. So you can have oh, it bouncing. And say, no, no, I don't really like it. I want to make it a loop. And yeah, you can do these things in Instagram, for example, or you could do these in Snapchat. But then you're stuck in that platform and if you want to send it to you know uncle bill who doesn't use social networks it, it's it's a real process to get it out where with this it's just it it will send it as a live photo to anyone on ios and it will burn it out as a animated gif gif to anybody not on ios so you you can just share it over messages you can you can even drop the file to somebody if you want to so it so just gives you the ability to quickly make this these. is a step forward in portrait this is called um this, this is live photo no i'm looking at grid now oh yeah those yeah so yeah. tell me about this what's the, what's going on here so now that if you scroll down, there's also a really uh, cute little feature that they've got in there. I, oh, sorry, it's a little bit higher up. Okay. Um, where they have a um, a level. Uh, did I put it in there? I think it's in there somewhere. I might have forgot to put it in there. But there's a new feature. There's a level in the iOS camera app now where if you go horiz if you move the camera so you're shooting straight down or straight up, it superimposes um, a cross mark. Cro uh, Sorry, Hatch cross mark. marks on it. Yeah, and then you can Hatch put those marks. over on top of each other and it makes sure that the photo is level. So your brunch looks perfect or your dramatic upshot of the building looks spot on. Oh, uh, so and it, they just it, fade in. it fixes the tilt or? Yeah, it fades in and then you can make sure it's tilted perfectly to get the oh, wow. exact downward shot, not on an angle. And then it fades out again. And it only works if you have the grid on because they sort of feel that people who are obsessed enough to have a grid on really care right. about that sort of thing. Right. And they won't bug That's you with perfect. extra data. They're if you exactly don't. Yeah. right. Yeah, if you're, if you're using yeah. a grid, you'd want to know that. Um, and but so Heath is a standard. It's it's a, yes. an ISO standard. It's MPEG. It's just not widely supported yet. But it makes sense that Apple should push this forward. Because it gives you a lot more information. Should be a lot more of a standard when there's 70 million phones that are using. Yeah, you know, yeah. right. Yeah. No, it's, yeah. To, to me, to me, the big deal is just the the, the fact that it's a container. Because now yeah. there's so much data that's being collected that like, even when I'm taking pictures with, again, my old-timey <laughs> Lumix camera here, it's like, okay, so there's a JPEG. There is also a raw picture. There is also, for video, there's also another sidecar file that has been written uh, for another piece of uh, software to pick up. It'd be nice if, as computational photography is 
being provided with so much different pieces of information, if a phone can be empowered to say, you know what, we're going to write to this file every single scrap of data we use per ourselves internally to build this JPEG so that a more sophisticated app today or 10 years from now can exploit that exact same information to make this phone, this picture even better because a JPEG is a JPEG is a JPEG, but uh, a JPEG with raw data plus depth information, that's cool stuff in 2019. Yeah, when right. you're using a JPEG, what you've basically said is to the software or the camera, all right, you make the decisions about exposure and, and everything, create a burned image that is fixed and export that. Mm -hmm. But it's very hard. You can't do much to that JPEG. You've lost everything but that actual image as developed. In effect, you're getting a developed image. And now, yeah. Yeah. But with, with the Heath format, you've still got all the data. You've got a render, the JPEG render, but you've also got the data that contributed to the render so you could change your mind, in other words. Well, and I think that one of the pressures that's going to be applied to most of the other software manufacturers to support it is, is that Apple does have its own photo uh, software you know, that's going to take advantage of that. Right. You know, so as, as right. it starts, as you start to have, as you start to, you know, have photos being able to change depth or, or, or um, some people are going to be going like, well, I don't want to take it into Lightroom because I can't, I, I don't have enough control. You know I mean? That's, that's, that's the danger that Adobe has if they don't support the format. So I, I have a feeling that we're going to see the format get supported within 12 months. Is this image, the like chain the link fence image, Renee, is this an example of portrait mode? Yeah. So, so in the past portrait had to have a human face or if it you was, were lucky, was, your dog was maybe. optimized for it. Yeah. It was yeah. optimized for that. It had a great deal of difficulty. And so what they've done now is again, it understands more scenes than it did before. It understands more objects than it did before. And also it can go to lower light levels than it could before. And it'll even work with a flash now. So they're just trying to make portrait mode work in a far wider range of of circumstances. So this is, a, I would say, an extraordinarily tough image, which is a, a focus is on the chain link fence. Now, in truth, the actual image, the camera phone picked, picked up probably had everything in focus. It's probably a very yeah. high, right. uh, very, uh, you know, aperture was, was, was uh, very closed down and very high aperture. But what it did, it was able, was able to use the depth information to defocus the back plane keep the front plane in focus and to do it almost perfect i don't see any flaws in well, this and i don't think i mean smooth smooth edges are one of the easier things to do well wow. oh, okay you know, wow, this you know, isn't so hard it, you know doing something like that in front of a you know some hair would be furry tough. yeah it's something that we always want to do and right. and some of the earlier photos that, that are in renee's article i think actually show much better hair resolution than we've seen in the past um here's an example know, it's, it's a little another, soft but it's there you know it's, it's yeah. probably missing a little bit there's of it. some problems but uh, but you don't know i mean it perfect. could be out of, a little out of focus but i'm there, zoomed but, way in yeah, on i don't think that too. would be as yeah. problematic as, as as i've seen the portrait mode be yeah. so i think that that there's definitely some improvements going on there and the thing with the chain link fence is not so much that it's a smooth surface, but that it recognizes the chain link fence and doesn't try to find a face to lock right. on you for portrait. Mode. Right. It, well, it didn't get fooled. And I, th yeah, I believe that. I mean, I'm not totally certain, but I believe that a lot of that has to do with you know basically what you're seeing in that live in the live uh, photo is is small movements in the camera's position, even micro movements in that camera position allows it um, with the two with the two lenses allows yeah. it to look at parallax and make a decision about what's close and what's far away. Yeah. And it's interesting, too, because now with a lot of those filters, it also does uh, um, uh, image stabilization. So when, he, when you're doing the live photo and then you tell it to do a loop or you tell it to do uh, a motion blur, it'll lock on everything that's not moving, stabilize that. And that in, that makes the loop or the bounce or the long exposure even more evident, like water flowing or hair right. you know, twirling, those sorts of things. So it's neat stuff. So I am now really excited about getting the new iPhone. <laughs> Between AR and... Oh, I think it's going to be and, big. And, oh, and that camera system is going to, like, you know, by all, by all indications, well, the camera system on there is going to be another big step forward. This, and this I, by itself would be enough. I, I think that the, the issue is, is that the, the uh, for the camera manufacturers, the hard part about this is just the trajectory of, you know, they, they're doing the best they can in a somewhat constrained, you know, a... a, 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 a a market that's actually getting smaller, their, their little island is getting smaller, revenue is getting smaller, and you have not just Apple, but Apple and Google and a lot of other folks that, that they're spending, I mean, the phone is, I mean, the, the, the phone being able to take great photos is a huge part of why we buy a new upgrade. Right. And so, I, I mean, I, I heard That's the number exactly was 200 right. or 250, you know, engineers that are just working on the, on the camera on, on yep. you know, wow. for, for Apple. And it's just hard when, the, when Apple's going to throw the, Apple's throwing the amount of money at this problem that Canon makes every 
you right. know, <laughs> right. Canon makes every year. You know, right. that's the that's the real challenge right. for for camera manuf manufacturers is that it's just it's just an enormous amount of energy being put into computational photography. And they're a computer company doing it, which means they have right. a lot of the the in house talent to really handle the edge cases. And, and the, they know how to make interfaces. Sorry. And <laughs> just like and while SLRs. Google does control the Pixel phone and yeah. probably will make a very exciting Pixel phone this year. Most Android phones are not made by Google, which means they don't control the hardware. That's hard. Uh, you know, Samsung does its own camera thing, which is mm -hmm. quite good, quite capable, mm -hmm. but it's different. Right. Well, that's that's why that they have the uh, they have their camera app that can be installed on individual Android phones. That's why they're selling their uh, the strength of their camera system as being uh, the Google Assistant. So that once you we right. we can't control how you take that picture, but believe me, once you get that picture on our service servers, we're going to send back we're going to drift back down a much better version of it than your crummy little blister pack CVS pharmacy phone yep. was able to take. <laughs> yep. Actually, Renee makes that point right at the beginning of his article that. Uh, Google has to do it server side. Apple can do it because they control the hardware on the on the phone. I'm now I'm excited. I can't I can't wait. We're gonna we're gonna know soon enough. It's uh yeah. in we're all approaching. likelihood a month away. Yeah, it's amazing how fast it's going. Whew. That's called life. Yeah. <laughs> it gets faster yeah. as you get farther down the slide. Every year is a smaller part of your life. <laughs> oh, is that why? That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Every year is now only one sixtieth of my life. Yeah, before, before it was half your life and then yeah. it was a third of your life. Oh, you're right. No, but I'm super excited. And like Andy's point previously, the competition just makes them all better because it is such a big selling feature that uh, you know everyone talks about the power of the camera and everyone has to race to keep up with that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's take a break. When we come back, uh, your picks of the week. Fellas, you're up for that? I'm ready. Sir. Let's get going. I want to congratulate Texture. Texture is the app of the day today on the uh, new iOS 11 app store. If you don't have iOS 11, I don't know if they still do that on uh, iOS 10. Do they, Renee? The new app store is great. It's got all these picks and, you know, it's got little kits and all sorts of stuff. I really like that. It'll be updated store. more frequently when it's out of beta. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but this today, Texture is the, uh, the, the app of the day, and rightly so. Texture is amazing. Think of Texture, I think the easiest way to describe it is uh, Texture is Netflix for magazines. So there are hundreds of great magazines out there. And if you were to subscribe to them all, well, it just cost you a ton. But what, but what if instead of subscribing to every magazine, or gosh, it'd be even worse if you went out and bought them all, right? What if you had every magazine possible available to you and you just got to read them on your iPad? Well, that's what texture is. Two, more than 200 of the best magazines, everything. Uh, at this point, I don't, I don't know what magazines aren't on Texture, but everything I want to read. Look at this. This is, this is the list. Everything from uh, ARP, the magazine, to Yoga Journal, <laughs> and everything in between. Backpacker, Canadian cy Cycling, Canadian Running, CBS Soaps in Depth, Oprah, the Oprah Magazine, Teen Vogue, Regular Vogue, Vanity Fair. I, you know, there is an article every month I want to read in Vanity Fair. It's on there. It's on there. And the thing is, when you subscribe to Texture, it's ten bucks a month. You get access to any of these magazines. You favorite the magazines you know you want all the time. I get National Geographic. That's absolutely when I automatically download. One of the reasons I love it is a National Geographic's images. In fact, any magazine with great pictures are better on the iPad than they are in print. They don't have to be screened. You get you get kind of the digital image which is amazing. Plus, you get features in magazines you can't get in print, like video. There's, a, there's curated picks, so if you don't know what to read. Look at all the computer magazines. PC Magazine, PC World, Popular Mechanics, Popular Science, Shutterbug, love that magazine. And Wired, I read that. I, there's always something I want to read in Wired. Sound and Vision for you uh, audio geeks. The thing is, you may not subscribe to Billboard. That's expensive, or Variety, or Ad Age, or Sound and Vision. But you don't have to. With Texture, you've got the entire issue. Every page, including the ads. It's the whole thing. Fit Pregnancy and Baby magazine. Girl's Life. Boy's Life. Every once in a while, I want to read uh, Boy's Life and go back to my youth. And it's so much fun. Road and Track. Golfers. Golf Magazine. Golf Tips. Men's Journal. Men's Health. Reminisce. Cruising the Classics. I tell you what. Here we, here we go. We got a two-week free trial for you right now. If you go to texture.com slash tweet, you don't have to take my word for it. But I should warn you, 
as soon as you sub sign up and download the texture app and put it on your phone or your tablet, you're going to say, oh, I can't live without this. And if you travel, if you're going away this summer, why bring a stack of magazines to the beach? Just bring your tablet and you've got them all. Texture.com slash twit. One of Apple's top 2016 iPads. And today it's the, uh, it's the pick of the day on the new iOS uh, 11 app store. And rightly so. Texture.com slash twit. Try it today. Time for the picks of the week. I think we've got to give you, Alex Lindsay, the pride of place here since we rarely get to see you in studio. <laughs> Did you. you bring some? By the way, this is you picked this wallet case. We should show this. It's, you picked that a couple of weeks ago. And it really, yeah, don't show your credit cards. But <laughs> it's, it's, it's uh, nice looking. It's got it's, a nice leather. It's, it's like really, little, it's uh, worn like a good wallet. Yeah, there we go. Gets a little bit worn. Yeah, it's, 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 I it's love a little, that. you know, it, it, I've, uh, you know, kind of ripped, you know, it's, it's definitely worn for wear on the side. I'm going to get that. But it's, uh, it's great. And I'm going to wait till the new iPhone comes It does out. limit. It doesn't shut quite right if you put too much in it. Yeah, so mine you're constantly, never did. No, yeah. there's a certain number of cards that I can keep in, right. which is plenty. Right. Um, the thing is, I never misplace my phone or my wallet because one or the other, I lose them together. I need both of them yeah, too often can't to, to make it work. So it's uh, it's good. Anyway, that was a pick anyway. in the previous life. What Still do you working. have for us today? So um, in my house, you know, I had some dead spots uh, for Wi-Fi. And I was, you know, and we've got this crazy Sonos system. There's like a whole bunch of Sonoses that weren't. Sonoses and Wi-Fi, they will kill Wi-Fi fast. Well, and I and I wired par them partially, you know. So yeah. there's, because there's. Um, you can do that. You can have a. They really, they're amazing. You 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 update you update one and they just go whoop, you know, and, and they and and uh, I but just did that. Yeah, and so the um uh and there's like you know there's uh, a lot in the house anyway. anyway so uh and so um, but getting the Wi-Fi working, getting it working for the phones, getting it working for my Amazon, you know, in different rooms. You know, I have the Amazon um, thing uh, that I won't say. Yeah, and uh, and then I'm also testing. We're testing with Google Home, so we have you know all of those things like floating around, and they were all having trouble, and they were all not quite working. So I decided I just got to solve this, and so I wanted something that I have a little bit more control than just a you know regular Wi-Fi setup. So I got um, Ubiquity's Amplify. Oh, interesting. So, so we're using heavier versions of Ubiquity for other things. Um, yeah, kind it's of the, the enterprise solution. It's a really good uh, solution for that. Yeah, I mean, and, and at the office we use a lot of Meraki systems, but the um, actually I think Megan's got my Amplify. If somebody wants to go get it. Right, and and so this is um, what you do is you hook you your hub up. You got the HD, not the. Uh, you got the, the. Uh, it, there's two of them. Uh, I got I, the one that's that's showing right here. Get the one that. Well, they both look like that, but you want to get the one that's tri band. There's a dual band. I did get a tri band. Yeah, one, get yeah. the good one. Yeah, yeah. It's a little more expensive, but it's worth it. Yeah. So the, and so I um, uh, so I, I put that in there, and I've been really happy with it. It's a little bit more set up than I expected. Um, I did have to call Comcast and work through. Really. Yeah, it just would not. It wouldn't. It wouldn't uh, show up. They had to reset something on their end to make that work. Now, admittedly, I also changed the modem, at, you know, a day before, so that might have been part of it. But it um, putting it once once I got that sorted out, setting up the the access points and you know, just setting up the little and it those, builds a and mesh. Those plug into the wall, which is yeah. nice. And so you find kind of discrete places to put them. the The nice thing about it is, is that there isn't. It's a mesh, so if it can't see the 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 host, it's a little bit slower, but it works. And so, um, so you just kind of plug it in. You see it on your iPhone. You you interconnect it. I think they're really good looking too. I really have nice. to say, once you plug it in, you've got the readout on the front, and then it forms a router on the back. So if you look yeah. at it on the back, you've got a couple outputs to, to do the routing yeah. on it. And and what you can do is you can also set up multiple networks. And what's nice about it is you can set up um, guest networks. So someone's coming over, you can set up a guest network just for them. It's kind of funny. You can say, you know, like, oh yeah, like, you know, you, you when, so when they come in and they network. look at their phone, and it'll be like Richard's Wi-Fi. Use this, Richard. You know, and the, the password, password is, is. You know, but, <laughs> but it's only open for like three hours, right? You know, and so right. while they're there, they have Wi-Fi, and it's not on your, you know, it's a, it's its right. own um, SSID, and so uh, the. Um, you know, I think that it, again, I think it works. It's not the same as, uh, you know, people try to compare it to the professional version, and there's a lot of things the professional version does. Um, but uh, but when you, it's when a you lot look at it, it's set up. But though. this was this was relatively easy to, um, once I got it up, it just, you just keep on adding points as you need them. And so I've got like four points in my, four points in the, in the base station in my house, and now everything is, it went from being rocky to smooth without a lot of, um, without a lot of work. These are the, uh, the uh, satellite units, and I, uh, you plug them into the wall, and then you can. What's nice is you can aim them. Yeah. But I got scared because one day I knocked this off. Right. But it's just a magnet. Yeah, you just pop it right back in. <laughs> it's like the yeah. nest outdoor. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. like the nest outdoor. Yeah. It's, it's, so anyway, it works. It works well, and, and it, you know, it, it over time gets. You know, it took a lot about a half an hour for it to like kind of 
I restarted it. I was doing something else, and then suddenly it really built the mesh out really nicely. That's and, one thing that does happen with all of these solutions. They get better over time. They get smarter over time. Yeah. And how many of the base? How many of the? I put four in. Four. Yeah. I put one in my my wife's office to make sure she was getting strong Wi-Fi. Um, yeah. My I, I, she. I mean, the house has mo has. I didn't. I could have gotten away with other things. My house has Cat Five in almost every major room, so it's oh, not I'm a so jealous. Um, so I, I still cat five at, 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 the, at the thing, but right. just having my phones and my, the, you know, everything else. That's one well. thing that this doesn't do that both the Eero and the Plume do. They have Ethernets on all the satellites. And if you have Ethernet jacks right. in that room, you can connect them and it builds an even stronger network because it's got an Ethernet backhaul. And I thought about it and I just realized nah. I just I just want to plug it in. I, I you know, at, at the, uh, um, we're, we're building mesh, larger meshes with their, professional line where, where you're doing poe that powers yeah, yeah. them and gives them ethernet yeah. and so on and so forth i think but anyway i was, I was pretty happy with we've it. used ubiquity i think we're using ruckus uh today but ruckus are good too yeah. ruckus are very yeah. good too the amplify and it turns out they don't sell the other one anymore i guess the hd is the one they sell at amplify.com a-m-p-l-i-f-i.com whole home wi-fi and i'll tell you we have i wish you'd told me because this one's just been sitting around here because I bought it for testing, but nobody seems nobody seems to want it. We'll so. see. They, it, well, we'll good. fix that, Leo. <laughs> I have them all. I use them all at home. We have an ear, the new Eros, who are right. our sponsor, and I have uh, plumes because I have two networks, and I use them all. I uh, well, in my office, in my office, I also have a Meraki because that ties me to, into the exactly. office. Exactly. Forget there's, a mesh. You have a weave network. They're different. Ne well, it's different uses for different yep. use cases, but uh, there you go. You're Amplify, and that's not well, even an Alex. And, and, it's and, a half an Alex. I'm afraid I have a phone call that I thought this was a safe time to schedule it. See you later. Thank, Thank you, Alex. Thanks, Thanks, guys. It Thanks. is normal. See you guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Renee Ritchie, your pick of the week. So I have two really quick picks because I was talking a lot about photography this week. I was playing with some more photo apps, and one of them is a really nice indie app by Ben Rice called Obscura. It's a camera app. One of the things Apple hasn't done and, and won't do is put a lot of fussy manual controls in their camera app. It's meant for what exactly Andy said earlier in the show. It's that you just want to pick up the phone, take a photo, and get a really good result and not have to worry about it or fuss with it too much. So what they've done is create a lot of APIs for developers. It lets them do things like pull out the high dynamic range data, the high color data, the DCI-P3 data, the raw camera data, and then developers can make apps that let you tweak exposure oh, or right. focus or all these different things. And Obscura is one of those, and it's a really nice design. Ben is sort of really well known because he photographs a lot of the Apple conferences like Ool and he used to do Singleton, and he takes really, really nice photos. And he sort of built his dream camera app out of this. So it gives you a lot of control and a lot of power over what you do with the iPhone camera. But it's still in an interface that's very simple and very accessible. So if you if you want to take the plunge, if you want to go beyond Apple's built-in camera app, but you don't want to go into something really complicated, I'd recommend Obscura. It's just a really nice way to get your feet wet with manual controls and with uh, – raw data and things like that. Uh, and the second one is at the opposite end of the spectrum, and this is a huge mega company, Adobe. Uh, they're doing a better job, I and mean, they haven't brought full-on Photoshop to the iPad, which a lot of people would still like them to do, but they have brought Lightroom uh, to the iPad, and, it, and it's fairly good. It's not exactly Lightroom, as you know and love on the desktop, but it's Lightroom that can do a lot of things. I would say the interface is more challenging, and again, Adobe has a really hard and complex problem to solve. On, a, on an iPad, so you the, it is a little bit harder to learn the steep, the learning curve is a little bit steeper, but you get access if you're already, especially if you're a Creative Cloud subscriber, you have access to your library, you have access to all your photos, and if you are on the go, if, if you're winding down, if you have your feet up, if you're in the coffee shop, and you just want to take those photos that you've shot, and maybe you've worked on them on your desktop, or you've taken them with your phone, or you've taken them with a camera and uploaded them earlier, you can just pull those onto your iPad and do like a gradient mask and play around with uh, make the sun look just the, make the stars look just the way you like it or bring out all the detail in the ground that's below the bright bright sky and make the photo look more like what you remember it looking like and it while it is complicated it's still super fast and I, I find I can get results using it in a few minutes that I'd probably I won't say waste but spend a lot more time on the desktop trying to emulate so. Uh, two very different apps but both really great for someone who wants to do more photography. And we should mention that Obscura is free. Yeah. I that kind of blows me away that he gives this away for free. I yeah, I wish he would charge a lot of. I mean, he I believe he started off charging a lot for it, but it's a hard market. Yeah. So uh, Apple does give the app a access to the raw data. Yeah, they have APIs for almost everything, and now they're going to have APIs for the depth data. They have APIs for the raw data. They have APIs for exposure and for um, 
uh, focus and for ISO. I mean, just almost anything you can think of, they're giving you an API for it these days. I wonder if Ben will start charging, say, you know, free for the iPhone 7 version, but if you want the iPhone 8 version, start charging I'm for that. I'm almost sure. I didn't know it was free because I'm pretty it, sure it was it paid free? initially. It's yeah, it's it's four ninety nine here. Oh, I must have bought it, it then. Because, oh, yeah, maybe yeah. then. Yeah, because I thought <laughs> I must it have bought it before because it didn't cost me anything to download it. Well, four ninety nine is a good deal. That's not that's still a steal. Yeah, I'm glad yeah. he is charging for it. I would have had to DM him right after the show if not. Say so, yeah, really. Uh, <laughs> oh, thank you, Andy. I for some reason I must have bought this once before. <laughs> yeah, I, I wish I wish that uh, the app the app store would fix that because sometimes you want to recommend an app to somebody or sometimes yeah, you want no to buy you, yeah. you, you want to give an find app to somebody price. but you don't know yeah yeah, yeah. we have that yeah. problem on ios today all the time i have to ask yeah. the tds not buy it and tell it i have what to it find costs. the non-canadian yeah it's, it's, oh, it's that's another thing yeah uh, and by the way once again my pick of the week go to headlines.com <laughs> and get the justin trudeau oh, bare-chested uh, canada uh, oh, t-shirt native land <laughs> One of those Canadian geese in the setting in sun, yeah. and a, a polar bear, and Serenity Caldwell. The on the Rockies. <laughs> and the, the Rockies. And 100% pure Trudeau. <laughs> I like that. Andy and I go, your pick of the week. <laughs> uh, uh, don't forget that uh, Mac OS has really great scripting options and automation. Uh, and if you are not aware of that, uh, Take Control Books has a really good book. Uh, Joe Kissel has uh, just updated uh, his uh, take control of automating your Mac uh, to a second, the second edition. It's 15 bucks, but it'll walk you through all the different ways that you can take processes that take multiple steps on your Mac and have it just triggered by a script or not even have to trigger it at all. You just simply have a folder where things, if things land in the folder, then magical things start to happen. Uh, all kinds of, th it also covers things like uh, 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 all the way from Apple Script Automator to Shell Scripts. Uh, to I think that it even goes to certain things you can do on iOS, things you can do with Siri, uh, macros, and Microsoft Office. Really, you have no idea how much time you're wasting on your Mac uh, that is not related to Twitter or Instagram until you read a book like this and you realize that with maybe a couple of hours of effort maximum, you could take something that you always have to do that, that, that sucks 15 minutes each and every time and turn it into just a simple menu or a simple thing you double click on and it automatically works. Uh, I really wish that Apple would spend a lot more time promoting Automator and Apple Script and the uh, automation features because it's not as though you can't automate things on Linux or Windows, but I don't think that it had, either of those have the same kind of consumer-friendly, user-friendly tools for doing that sort of stuff. Uh, 15 bucks, uh, go to takecontrolbooks.com. Uh, and another quick plug uh, that if you are in the San Francisco Bay Area uh, in Santa Clara, California, tomorrow is the Command-D Masters of Automation Conference uh, where uh, Sal Segoyan and, uh, and Naomi and uh, Paul Kent are putting together have put together an entire day-long conference all about automation solutions on Mac OS and on iOS. Uh, it's being sponsored by, uh, it's being sponsored by, uh, uh, by uh, the Omni Group uh, that is as in well invested in uh, in automation as uh, pretty much more than any, any other uh, company these days. Uh, and it's great people, great people to hang out with. Uh, it's their first year of doing this, and it was. It's one of the people organizing this is the is Paul Kent, of course, who used to organize nothing less than Mac World Expo every single year. Uh, so uh, you can you can feel like this is going to be the ground floor of I think something that's going to be really really cool. I hope to be there next year uh, because it just looks just super super cool. Uh, but it does it does start tomorrow. We can go to uh, through the site uh, cmddconf.com. I will have a, I should have a talk with them about but urls uh, but cmddconf.com uh you can sign up through eventbrite and be there tomorrow and hang out with some cool people and learn some cool stuff i'm so glad you plugged that because uh, i i wanted to do that last week and i forgot so yeah it is tomorrow at the hilton santa clara in uh, santa clara california absolutely awesome ladies and gentlemen our time has come to say goodbye to all the family we already said goodbye to alex Lindsay, but let's not forget Andy Anako, he's at the Chicago Sun-Times, his website, cwob.com. His uh, Flickr account, if you want to see his amazing images, mm -hmm. is Andy I. He's on the Twitter, I-H-N-A-T-K-O. I have no idea how to spell it. I-H-N-A-T-K-O. And um, we will see you again next week. I hope you feel better. Me too. Thank, Thank you. Go to your favorite diner and have a bowl of <laughs> matzo ball soup. You'll feel that's, that's on the plan for tomorrow. If you don't feel Big better, breakfast. you'll at least be well-fed.
We're sending Andy Power, the Kryptonian son. <sighs> there he is, master of the power of the Kryptonian son, Mr. <laughs> Rene Nitch, Richie at imore.com. Read his great article on uh, iOS 11 photography at imore.com. And of course, his podcasts are there and, and lots more. And he does a great podcast too at relay.fm. Nako's Almanac. Thank you for being here for our podcast, Mac Break Weekly. We do it every Tuesday, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 1800 UTC. If you want to be in the studio audience as our visitor from the UK, he's traveling all over the United States. He's seeing all the highlights, Yosemite. He's seeing New York City, San Francisco. And for some reason, he included us in that. Uh, thank you for being here. All you have to do is email tickets at twit.tv. We'll put a seat out for you. If you want to watch on the stream, it's twit.tv slash live. But if you do that, please join us in the chat room at irc.twit.tv. Be part of the fun group, the kids in the back of the class, the wiseacres. You can also get on-demand versions of everything we do at our website, twit.tv. In this case, twit.tv slash mbw. And you can also uh, subscribe. We have a subscribe page that explains it. But if really the easiest thing to do is... Get that program, whatever it is you listen to podcasts with, and search for Mac Break Weekly and subscribe, and you'll have an episode in your inbox every Tuesday afternoon. Thanks for being here, and we'll see you next time. Now get back to work, because you know what? Break time is over. Break time.